And welcome to the third Mexico Moving Forward Symposium here at the beautiful campus of UCSD. Welcome to America's finest, finest city if you're visiting with us. My name is Laura Castaneda or Laura, whichever you prefer. I'm a local journalist and also the chair of the communications department at San Diego City College. I've covered the border extensively as a journalist, so it gives me great pleasure to be here today. The Center for U.S.-Mexican Studies at the School of International Relations and Pacific Studies at UC San Diego is pleased to welcome everyone here today. During the day, we're going to hear presentations from experts on progress and challenges in Mexico 20 years after the signing of NAFTA. The presentations will be followed by a moderated discussion, and then we will University of California's 20th president after public service as Secretary of Homeland Security, Governor of Arizona, Attorney General of Arizona, and U.S. Attorney for the District of Arizona. The recipient of numerous honors, she received the Anti-Defamation League's Institute Service Award in 2012. And before she comes up, I would like to ask you to hold your applause as I'm going to go ahead and introduce the other speakers, and then we'll have uh, the president come up. Also in this section to speak with you this morning is Pradeep Kosla, the Chancellor of UC San Diego. He's a distinguished electrical and computer engineer. He has an elected, he's an elected member of several prestigious academies, including the National Academy of Engineering. Kosla initiated and led UC San Diego's first ever strategic planning process, which created a unifying vision for the campus future. Peter Cowley is the Dean of the School of International Relations and Pacific Studies. He has served as Senior Counselor in the Office of U.S. Trade Representative under President Obama and Chief of the International Bureau of the Federal Communications Commission under President Clinton. He currently sits on the Binational Expert Group appointed by the U.S. and Chinese governments to address technology policy issues involving the two countries. Dr. Antonio Ortiz Mena is the head of the Section of Economic Affairs at the Mexican Embassy in Washington, D.C. He was a professor of international relations at Centro de Investigación y Docencia Económicas, or CID, and held chair of the International Relations Department for three years and was a member of Mexico's NAFTA negotiation team. Madam President, if you would like to come up first, welcome. Well, thank you. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here with you this morning. And I must say, I thought the dinner uh, last night was extraordinary and gave us uh, an opportunity to uh, raise and have some wonderful conversations. Uh, I'd like to begin this morning with the words of a man who is important both to Mexico and to the University of California. As a young man, he received a Guggenheim Fellowship to study at UC Berkeley. Later, he served as a Mexican diplomat. He wrote poems, essays, world-renowned texts, and a few years before he died, he won the Nobel Prize for Literature. The man, of course, was Octavio Paz. He is justifiably celebrated for the contributions he made to world literature and to political thinking. But Octavio Paz is also a man who reflected on and wrote about the connections between California and Mexico. His magnum opus, The Labyrinth of Solitude, begins not in Mexico, but in Los Angeles, a city where he lived for a year as a child. Later in life, Paz wrote about the significance of dialogue. And I quote, democracy is dialogue. Dialogue allows differences to remain, yet at the same time creates an area in which the voices of otherness coexist and interweave. It's in that spirit of dialogue that we gather today. In January, the University of California and Mexico together announced a joint undertaking, the UC-Mexico Initiative. UC and Mexico now stand at the beginning of a long learning journey. Because for this partnership to be successful, 
It must be one of equals where both sides are engaged and both sides possess true ownership. The UC Mexico initiative is truly a dialogue, but a dialogue accompanied by action. To invoke Octavio Paz, it is an opportunity for dialogue that, quote, creates an area in which the voices of otherness coexist and interweave. And who knows where we will end up. But even if the destination is unknown, the journey will be informative and transformative. We at the University of California are tremendously excited about the opportunities the partnership presents. I've already had a number of meetings, uh, as has uh, the leadership of the University of California, uh, including the chancellor, including the dean here, uh, and with many of our consuls general and, and the ambassador in Washington, D.C. Uh, let me just say, there is a world of possibilities before us, but the time is now, the window is open. We should have a sense not only of uh, desire and will to do this, but a sense of urgency in getting it done now. So let's get moving. Uh, let's get moving together, and let's get moving in a way that sets the example for how the partnership between the United States and Mexico should operate. And now it's my pleasure to turn the podium over to Chancellor Kosla. Chancellor. Thank you, President Napolitano. And uh, please join me in welcoming her one more time because she made a special trip just to be here with us. I think, I think our president's uh, presence uh, on our campus and especially for this symposium clearly is indicative of the UC system's uh, support for deeper ties with Mexico and also indicative of UC San Diego's support both for the UC system and for deeper ties with Mexico. It's a great honor to be here. It's so good to see many of you. I saw some of you last evening. I hope that you slept well. Uh, this is a great symposium. As I was looking at uh, what's going to happen during the course of the day, uh, it is worse than my own schedule because you're not going to have any time to even go to the restroom. It's like a jam-packed day with really high-impact, high-intensity speakers and on a topic which was extremely relevant 20 years ago, and it's equally relevant, if not more, today. And uh, this is a, NAFTA is a very important topic, and I think we at UC San Diego and the the Center for U.S.-Mexican Studies uh, within the school of IRPS has taken a lead role in developing a scholarship uh, around this topic and around Mexico as a country, and that's why we, our Center for U.S.-Mexican Studies is so well known. It's also one of the largest residential programs in the country. Uh, it has uh, welcomed about 600 uh, visitors during the last 33 years it has been in, in existence, and it was founded pretty much at the same time as our school of IRPS which is around 1979. So we have a very long history of uh, working with our neighboring country. Now, Mexico is a very interesting country for many, many reasons, as you all know. And it's hard for me to tell you anything that you don't know because nearly half the audience are very senior people from Mexico. So please uh, pardon my... Uh, you can pardon my telling you the facts, which you know better, of course. So it's the 15th largest economy in the top 15 economies in the world today, and by 2050, it's going to be top 10 economies. I think it just makes logical sense that being our neighbor to the south, we really have a very deep working uh, relationship, and we have very deep historical ties going back a uh, long time ago. Uh, secondly, uh, Mexico graduates more engineers than the state of California, So, and that is significant because if you look at the U.S. economy, it's been driven mainly by science and technology. So I imagine the Mexican economy over time is going to grow and be driven by science and technology. The number of universities has nearly doubled in the last decade or so. So it is logical that what our president said, that we have deeper ties, not only as two countries, but with the UC system and all the universities in Mexico become relevant. My point to you is just one that I want to make. So if you look at the history of this country, our economic development post-World War II, which is the dominant period of our economic development, has been driven by universities, by investments in research and development at universities, by investments 
participants in PhDs uh, at universities who go out and create companies, Google being a great example. So as you, the leaders in Mexico, the policymakers, think about it, I want you to look at the U.S. and learn a little bit or at least tell us what we did right and what we didn't do right in terms of our policy of integrating uh, building great research universities, integrating sub policies to create economic development, and tying the two closely so that the universities are not independent of society on the outside and our companies come from the universities. So that is my real goal. And I think economic development was the goal of NAFTA, done in a different way. It is the goal of every country right now. And we stand here uh, ready, able, and willing to help. In fact, eager to help. And UC San Diego especially because of our location and our geography. So thank you very much and welcome. And it's now my pleasure, my honor, to introduce uh, Dean Peter Cowie, without who this symposium would not happen. Peter? Good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to see so many friends, especially friends from Mexico here today. Uh, we're gathered uh, today uh, and so fortunate to have uh, the living proof before your eyes of the dynamic leadership of the University of California and the partnership between our President Napolitano and Chancellor Koslow, who together have made this deep commitment both to assuring that the University of California will remain the greatest university system in the world and achieve new uh, roles of importance to society, and also to building this partnership between the United States and Mexico in this rapidly evolving world. I'd like to thank uh, our lead sponsors for today, without whose support this would not be possible, and they include SEMPRA, the SIMSA Group, and Sunroad Automotive. When we created Mexico Moving Forward, and this is our third symposium, our goal was to have an annual forum for convening scholars and leaders in practice to undertake the type of open dialogue that can only occur in a university environment where there is no underlying agenda politically or economically. Instead, we are trying to encourage the deepest and most creative thought searching for better understanding of the issues facing society. We're fortunate that at UC San Diego, because of early decisions of the leadership of the university, because of the commitment of our School of International Relations and Pacific Studies, and uh, the creation of the Center for U.S.-Mexican Studies, that we've had the honor to help build that dialogue over the years. Today, we're going to be looking at many of the fundamental economic and social trends confronting our two countries both in terms of decisions being made in Mexico and in terms of our interdependent growth and evolution in this rapidly changing world economy and a world where the technology underpinnings of our everyday life are evolving rapidly in front of our eyes. We hope that that conversation, along with the recognition of the cultural aspects that also tie together our two societies will lead to an extraordinary moment of discovery for everybody in this room. Finally, I'd like to say that at the School of International Relations and Pacific Studies, we're especially proud that our students are deeply engaged in this conversation as part of their everyday training. We believe that by training professional leaders who can reach across the worlds of public policy, management, international relations, and ground them in the hardest-nosed, toughest-thinking, empirical and analytic techniques, that they can respond to this changing society and really help provide that next generation of leadership that both of our countries are relying on to achieve the transformation that we believe is so vital to both of our countries' interests. We thank you for your interest and commitment. We look forward to the conversation today, and I thank all the participants in the symposium for taking the time and effort out of their busy schedules to join us today. Thank you. I join you in welcoming all of our scholars and participants today.
No, uh, we did for Antonio already. Come on up. We did introduce him. Sí, sí. Más fácil. Introductions done. Thank you. Buenos días. Good morning, everyone. I am uh, Antonio Ortiz, the Head of Economic Affairs at the Embassy of Mexico, and it really is an honor to be here with uh, President Napolitano, with uh, Chancellor Kosla and Dean uh, Peter uh, Cowie. Uh, Ambassador Eduardo Medina Mora asked me to convey his best wishes for a very successful symposium and for a vigorous research and outreach agenda for the Center for U.S.-Mexican Studies and the UC system in general in the coming years. President Napolitano alluded to this, and I think there's a huge opportunity right before us, and we will grasp it. We will grasp it. I truly am among friends. Uh, many, many of those of you in the audience uh, I've seen in different uh, eras of uh, my life during the NAFTA negotiations at CIDE, at the Embassy of Mexico these uh, past years, uh, former professors, former students. So in a way, this is a very emotional uh, moment for me, and I'm also a graduate of UC San Diego. Uh, I spent about six years here. I, I earned my PhD the hard way you know, uh, here at uh, UCSD, but it's, it's, it's worth it. It's, it's, it's worth it. So I'm very, very proud to be here as a UCSD uh, graduate. At the symposium, we will learn about the arts and culture of uh, contemporary Mexico from the creators and artists themselves. We will hear a plurality of voices and views on NAFTA and on North American developments, on domestic reforms in Mexico, which are aimed at boosting productivity, economic growth, and employment in Mexico. We will hear about the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, in which the three North American countries are participating, and which will result in very, very important rules for international economic engagement in the 21st century. We will also hear about the Pacific Alliance between Mexico, Colombia, Chile, and Peru, which is a very pragmatic and results-oriented model of open regionalism. And surely we will hear about engaging with China. I think this is a critically important issue for Mexico and for North America as a whole. Now I believe that UCSD is uniquely poised to undertake path-breaking and rigorous research and outreach in all these topics with the Center for U.S.-Mexican Studies, CILAS, the Center for Iberian and Latin American Studies, the Institute of the Americas, IRPS. So both the venue and the topics that will be addressed today make for a very powerful combination indeed. Given that the, in 2014 is the 20th anniversary of NAFTA's entry into force, and the North American Leader Summit took place just about two weeks ago, I will center my remarks on where we see Mexico in the context of North America now and about North America in the future. An old African saying states that there are two ideal times to plant a tree, 20 years ago and right now. <laughs> well, we did plant a tree 20 years ago with NAFTA. And NAFTA represented a, a very big leap forward in the strategic outlook and the rules government economic interaction in North America. In the next section, a very distinguished panel will assess NAFTA. But I do want to underscore just how forward-looking the agreement was at its time. We need only recall the 1992 presidential debates in which a famous Texan and feisty independent candidate to the U.S. presidency Ross Perot said that NAFTA would create a giant sucking sound. I cannot do a very good Texan accent, but maybe you can imagine it. As uh, NAFTA sent U.S. jobs to Mexico because of wage differentials between both countries. At the same time, some groups in Mexico also feared sucking sound, but in the exact opposite direction. They thought that Mexico would lose jobs because U.S. corporations were larger and had easy access to capital and technology. We were really treading upon new ground. There was no precedent for such a far-reaching trade agreement between a developing country and two developed countries. And by its scope and coverage, NAFTA was in fact the most advanced free trade agreement in the world. 
Now, assessing NAFTA has become somewhat of a cottage industry. But if one focuses on NAFTA's pre preamble, if you judge NAFTA on its own terms, the countries state that they seek to create an expanded and secure market for the goods and services produced in their territories to establish clear and mutually advantageous rules governing their trade and to ensure a predictable commercial framework for business, planning, and investment. If we focus on that, I think that NAFTA has been a clear success. Intra-NAFTA trade was about $288 billion in 1993, the year before NAFTA went into force, and it is now over $1 trillion, about 273% increase. Bilateral trade between Mexico and the U.S. went from about $80 billion to about $500 billion annually, which is about $1 million per minute. And that means that by the time I finish speaking, about 10 to 15, minutes, uh, 10 to 15 million dollars in bilateral trade will have uh, taken place. Mexico is now the third largest trade partner of the U.S. and second largest export destination. And in fact, the U.S. exports more to Mexico than to Japan and China combined, than to the BRIC countries combined. And I had to get this new statistic. Uh, soccer fans here know that the World Cup is on its way. And you might also know that in the history of the event, eight different countries have won the World Cup, or maybe nine if Mexico wins it uh, this year. And you might be surprised to hear that Mexico also buys more goods from the US than do all the eight countries that have won the FIFA World Cup combined. And I will leave it to you to figure out which countries uh, these are. Now, while the goal of NAFTA was the establishment of a free trade area, something much more significant has happened. North America has become a region of shared production. We are jointly producing goods through the deeply integrated production and supply chains that have developed as a result of the clear, stable, and transparent rules established by NAFTA. And we are increasingly engaging in the global economy as a single region. The paradigmatic example of North American integrated production is the auto industry, but the aerospace industry has become increasingly salient. To give you just but one example, Bombardier, the Canadian aerospace company, is uh, producing uh, parts of the Learjet 85 in Querétaro, it's producing the fuselage. That jet uses Pratt & Whitney engines produced in Canada, and final assembly takes place in Wichita. Kansas. And as I said, this is just a single example of what is already taking place in North America. This is due not only to the trade that has taken place, but to the intra-regional investment. It might not surprise you to learn that the U.S. is the main foreign investor in Mexico, and uh, it, it invested about $168 billion from 1999 to 2013 in Mexico, which is just about half of total foreign direct investment in Mexico. But you might also be interested to learn that Mexican investment in the U.S. is also growing significantly. Uh, there are different estimates, but uh, on one count is that there, were, there was about $20 billion worth of Mexican investment in the U.S. from 1999 to 2013. And 40 out of the 50 states of the U.S. have at least one world-class Mexican-based company, such as Cemex, Gruma, Grupo Alfa, Grupo Mexico, Lala, Bimbo, and Mexichem there. So, you know, this is not only the U.S. investing in Mexico, this is Mexico investing in the U.S. This growing intra-regional investment can be seen in the percentage of U.S. value added in U.S. import. It is 2% from Japan and from the European Union. It is 3% for imports from Brazil and 4% for Chinese imports. It is 25% for imports from Canada and 40% for imports from Mexico. That is to say, U.S. imports from Mexico have 10 times more value added than U.S. imports from China. Now, the success of NAFTA was largely the result of the rules of the agreement, but particularly the trade and investment decisions made by business leaders during these past two decades. But if we are to take North American integration and competitiveness to the next level, we need to have a much stronger and proactive engagement between the public and private sector and to truly think and act regionally. The world economy has changed radically in these last two decades. 
services loom much larger now, as they did 20 years ago, as does e-commerce. We have advanced manufacturing, including 3D printing, which means that we need a very highly skilled workforce, streamlined regulations, and vastly improved infrastructure and logistics, not only at border crossings, but throughout North America. And by the way, I believe uh, there was an excellent program at UCSD TV last April, hosted by uh, Dean Cowie, about uh, advanced manufacturing in the U.S., perhaps a new program on advanced manufacturing in North America could be done. The energy landscape, yeah, all right, great. You see, we're always already doing things. The energy landscape has also changed dramatically. During the NAFTA negotiations, Mexico did not open its hydrocarbon sector to foreign investment, but with last December's constitutional reform, Mexico's horizons are to change radically and for the better. Meanwhile, according to the International Energy Agency, the U.S. is slated to overtake Saudi Arabia and Russia as the world's top oil producer in 2015, and in its energy outlook to 2040, ExxonMobil estimated that by 2020, North America would become a net natural gas exporter and a net export of oil around 2030. North America thus has all the necessary energy resources to fuel its economic growth for a long time, and reliable and affordable energy will be a key component in ensuring a very competitive North American manufacturing base. So we need what needs to be done and are already making strides. Last September, Vice President Joe Biden was in Mexico and he formally launched the high-level economic dialogue, the so-called HLED. Under the HLED, uh, the Mexican and U.S. governments, in close coordination with stakeholders, foster a series of initiatives aimed at reducing transaction costs to businesses in the region. We are launching initiatives in areas such as transportation, telecoms, strategic logistics corridors. I believe logistics will become increasingly important for the competitors of the North American region. And in addition to the HLED, last May, President Peña Nieto and Obama agreed to create a bilateral forum on higher education, innovation, and research, which we call FOBESI for its Spanish acronym. The FOBESI will develop a shared vision for educational cooperation with a view to expanding economic opportunities in both countries and developing workforce attuned to the needs of the 21st century economy. In close collaboration with academia, business, and stakeholders, FOBESI will develop initiatives on, among other issues, workforce development, student and academic mobility, research, technological development, and innovation partnerships, and language instruction. The Mexican FOBESI advisory group has already presented what we call the Proyecta 100,000, Proyecta 100,000, which aims to send 100,000 Mexican higher education students to the U.S. by 2018, and is part of the proposed 100 plus 50 strategy, which aims to send 50,000 U.S. students to study in Mexico also by 2018. These are doubtless very, very ambitious goals, but I think we have to be very ambitious. And I think this is particularly relevant given that Mexico comes in at ninth place in the number of higher education students in the U.S. I think we can and we should and we will do much better. Let me now turn briefly to the Toluca Summit, which provided a new impetus to transnational engagement by highlighting some of the commitments that have a bearing on North American co competitiveness. I'll just list some of them so that you get a sense of the initiatives that we are pursuing in terms of North American competitiveness. Maybe some of these, this information, uh, even though it's publicly available, does not register. I think it's, it's very, very important just to get a sense of what we are doing. We will develop a North American competitiveness work plan focused on investment and innovation. We will jointly promote and support to underscore jointly promote trade and investment in sectors where our integrated production chains give us a comparative advantage. I gave the example of the auto sector and the aerospace sector. We will conduct a mapping of industrial clusters to promote development, innovation, and investment. I'm sure there's a huge potential between San Diego and Tijuana. We will establish a North American transportation plan. 
We will build on existing bilateral border mechanisms to expedite the safe movement of goods across North America and promote trilateral exchanges and logistics corridors. We will strengthen regulatory cooperation in order to reduce transaction costs for businesses. Right now, we focus more on two bilateral uh, regulatory initiatives. We will try to see where there are complementarities to take a trilateral as opposed to bilateral approach. We will establish a North American Trusted Traveler Program, which will allow vetted travelers to more easily cross borders between the three countries. And turning more to educational issues, we will establish a trilateral council for research, development, and innovation, and promote joint research in national laboratories and universities, strengthening links with companies across North America. And finally, we will hold a meeting of energy ministers of North America to explore common strategies on energy efficiency, infrastructure, innovation, renewable energy, non-conventional energy sources, energy trade, and responsible development of energy resources. So, as you can see, and to paraphrase uh, Shakespeare, if I may, uh, the Toluca summit was much ado about North American competitiveness. <laughs> These commitments are building on the foundation that we laid some 20 years ago and are an acknowledgement that our economies are not in a zero-sum game with each other, but rather are competing together as one unit in the global marketplace. And while North America is one of the most competitive and dynamic regions in the world, there's still huge untapped potential. Looking towards the future, PricewaterhouseCoopers has estimated that in 2050, the five largest economies in the world will be China, the US, India, Brazil, and Japan. Mexico will be the seventh largest economy in 2050 after Russia. The US and Canada will be the top two countries in the world in 2050 in terms of GDP per capita, while Mexico will be the top Latin American country in that regard. But the future is not a foregone conclusion. The future is what we make of it. And here I want to mention my uh, dear friend, the late Bob Pastor, uh, founder of the Center for North American Studies at the American University. I had a, a long discussion with him some time ago. A lot of people had discussions with uh, dear Bob. And um, he said that one should not pursue aims because they are feasible, but they are desirable. And in forging the future of North America, we are making feasible what is desirable. And I believe that we must remain as forceful and as ambitious as were those who spearheaded NAFTA negotiations more than 20 years ago. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you to all of you, not only for inspiring us this morning, but for taking the time to be here. As we prepare for our first session, Mexico looking back NAFTA at 20, and we're switching out our panelists, I believe, at this time. I would also like to remind everybody that there's an overflow room. If you just head out the back uh, through these doors, um, they will escort you to a room where there's some comfortable chairs if you don't want to stand in the back. So I'm, and while we're switching out, I'll go ahead and tell you about this session. Mexico looking back NAFTA at 20. The session will look at all the changes in the last two decades in Mexico that have been brought about because of NAFTA. The session is being moderated by UCSD political science professor Peter Smith. This first session features the policymakers who initially put NAFTA to work and business leaders who have seen their industries change and grow under NAFTA. <laughs> the trade agreement officially began on January 1st, 1994. <laughs> the moderator, to tell you about him, Peter Smith is a professor at UC San Diego. Smith specializes in comparative politics, Latin American politics, and U.S.-Latin American relations. He served as director of UC San Diego's Center for Iberian and Latin American Studies and director of Latin American Studies. Our panelists, Juan Gallardo is the chairman of the Board of Organization Cultiva, 
Gallardo has held leadership positions in major companies in Mexico and was chosen to be the lead coordinator of an alliance of Mexican private sector organizations formed in 1990 to promote expanded trade with Mexico, particularly in the context of NAFTA. Carlos Elizondo is a professor at El Centro de Investigación y Docencia Económicas. Elizondo began as a professor and researcher at CIDE before becoming director in 1995. In 2004, he served as ambassador and permanent representative of Mexico to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development before returning to CIDE in 2006. Kenneth Schwendel is a member of the board of directors of Grupo Vis, Mexico's largest cattle and beef company. He previously served as executive director of Rabobank's food and agribusiness research in Mexico. Before joining Rabobank, he held leadership positions at the Banco Nacional de Mexico and the American Soybean Association for Mexico, Central American, and Caribbean Basin. He's taking the place today of Jesus Vizcarra, who was listed in the program but couldn't be here today. Each speaker will have approximately 15 minutes to present, and then Peter will begin to moderate the discussion, and then we'll go to the question and answer. So we'll begin with one. The idea was that I would be starting, if you don't mind. Yes, oh, that's fine. Thank you. <laughs> well, first of all, thanks a lot. I, I'll have a presentation. Thanks a lot for this opportunity to be here. After Antonio's great speech, it makes things much better because I'm just going to focus from the Mexican perspective because the seminar is maybe Mexico moving forward. So I'll try to answer some of the very sharp questions that Peter Smith sent us very diligently with enough time to, to, to try to think about them. And the main question I want to ask, and Antonio already quoted, what was the main objective of NAFTA? The main objective of NAFTA was creating growth. That NAFTA did. But what did NAFTA did not do? It did not create growth as expected. It wasn't necessarily what people thought would create, we created as a result of NAFTA. There's been this very interesting discussion in the last month between some of the guys that had participated in the discussion of NAFTA, Serra, and Herminio Blanco, Jaime Sabrodowski, among others. And Jaime Serra says that he never promised growth would, would, would be uh, as high as expected. But what is true, most people believe that growth would be much higher. I need some slides. I'm waiting for them to be projected. But the first argument is, of course, Mexico did profit in terms of exports, in terms of, of the growth of its, of, 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 of its export capacity immensely. Well, there are no slides to support my argument, but what you, <laughs> what, what you would be seeing is a very sharp rise of exports in the last 20 years, which is, believe me, really amazing. But the most, well, here they are. So this is the topic, what NAFTA did and did not. So let me start with very brief that. These are oil exports of Mexico. So the trend is more or less the same prior to NAFTA. The big change is not that we're exporting more. In fact, we're exporting less. The big, big change is that the price of oil is much higher than before. But these are non-oil exports. So that gives you a very clear idea of how swiftly NAFTA changed the dynamics. But bear in mind, as you, you can see in the year 2000, that our exports stopped growing, stopped growing in the year 2000. I'll explain why, and I'll go back to that anomaly in a moment. When you look only at manufacturing exports, uh, and exclude all non-manufacturing, where would, would, would include oil and mining and agricultural products, you still see a very, very sharp rise. Uh, if you look at uh, the trade balance, however, since the U.S. perspective, it has created a large sucking sound to remain Ant Antonio Ortiz Mena. Uh, the sucking sound was not what Mexican critics of NAFTA were expecting. Mexican thought that we would have an extremely deficit with the U.S., but what happened was extremely the contrary. Mexico has sustained a very large super rabbit, since from the U.S. perspective, a very large deficit, which is almost a mirror of what happened between Mexico and China. This is the trade deficit of Mexico vis-a-vis -vis China. It's, it's, it's very acute growth. Right now, our deficit is around $60 billion, and our super rabbit with the United States is around... Uh, 60 as well. So the trends are not identical, but the magnitudes today are exactly the same. So what basically did, NAFTA did 
it created a, a, an integrated uh, economy between uh, China and, and Mexico, between the United States and Mexico, and Canada, of course, but it needed a lot of input from China. Inputs that, if it weren't from Mexico, might have been processed directly in China and sent and increased the trade balance between China and Mexico. It's very briefly because I have a very small time, but it's worth in mind having the perspective of what happened to other Latin American countries. This is the export growth of Brazil and Mexico, and this is if we look only at manufacturing exports. Mexico is in red, Brazil is in green. So what you can see is that Mexico was transformed in terms of its export capacity of manufacturing goods, and compared to Brazil, I think that it's quite uh, revealing by itself. Now, one of the questions that Peter asked us is, what was the impact on, 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 on the countryside? And in terms of our total exports of agriculture and farming, and we have an expert here, so I won't deal much into this topic, there's been a significant growth. And even if you, if you look at the production of one product, which is corn, the production of corn did not collapse as many people thought it would happen. In fact, it depends on how much rain we had each year, but it's been more or less stable with some trend of, of growing with some years reaching almost 24,000 uh, tons. So it does show you that this idea that NAFTA would destroy the corn production in Mexico really did not take place. Uh, if we look at it from the U.S. perspective, certainly NAFTA has made uh, Mexico its third or second most important partner. If we look at total imports of the U.S., from different countries. This is Canada, they've been decreasing. This is China, an amazing growth. This is uh, Germany. This is the other uh, BRICS. Oh no, this is Brazil, sorry. Well, that's Brazil and this is Mexico. So Mexico has been gaining market share if you look at total imports of the US. But if we look only at manufacturing imports all those manufacturers that, makes that, that, that the U.S. buys from abroad, this is Canada, this is China, this is Japan, these are recent industrial countries, and this is Mexico. Mexico, in terms of manufacturing imports, and this data is only till the year 2012, I couldn't find them until the year 2013, Mexico is the second largest partner of, of the United States in terms of manufacturing imports, since from the uh, United States perspective. But what did NAFTA certainly did not do? It did not lead to a significant uh, growth in Mexico. If we, if we look at the growth of the three uh, NAFTA par uh, partners, this is the U.S., yearly uh, GDP growth of the U.S., of Mexico, and of Canada. It did create an amazing synchronization about, uh, between the three of them. But for a country which is much poorer which is the case of Mexico, this is a tragedy. Because what economic theory would predict is that if two countries start trading, the country that has the lowest GDP per capita should tend to converge into the level of development of the two largest countries. That's what happened in, in the European Union with Spain, uh, and that was happening, that's what's happening right now between China and the rest of the world. It certainly did not happen <coughs> in the case of Mexico. And so there are some questions to be asked. This was just the background. Now I'll try to answer why. No more slides, so we <laughs> can now forget numbers. Why? Of course, this would merit a very uh, complex discussion, but I'll throw some hypotheses of why growth did not come as expected. The first one has to do with a word that barely did not appear during the negotiation of NAFTA. Antonio, I don't know if you are still here, but I don't recall anyone, and I've reread some of the documents, no one considering the word China during the negotiations of NAFTA. China has been a very recent, in terms of these 20 years, a very recent entrance into the world market. And the whole idea is that Mexico was the cheaper guy in, the, in, 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 in this part of the world, and suddenly the world became much larger. And that's why, if you recall, in the year 2000, uh, Mexico's exports stopped growing. Why? An easy, pleased answer would be because Fox arrived to power, but it's wrong. 
the real reason is that China entered the World Trade Organization. And then our relative advantage of being inside of NAFTA, well, still, it's still much better NAFTA than being in the World Trade Organization, but the difference of salaries and other, and other prices between Mexico and China is such that we did, so, did, we did, so, did, did see a sucking sound going to China. And so the whole idea of, of NAFTA was based on the idea that Mexico could, ca could, could capture a lot of the U.S. investment that needed to relocalize because of higher wages in, in, in the U.S., etc., and it went to China. Secondly, our, our both for economic policy reasons and because of some structural changes, we ended with a very expensive peso. What were those reasons that were beyond what people uh, thought when negotiating NAFTA? First, the price increased dramatically. When we were negotiating to NAFTA, the price of oil was $10, $15, something like that. And by 2000, it had reached $100. And so the, the influx of, 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 peso, of dollars into the Mexican economy created an overvalued exchange rate compared to the very careful management in China of their exchange rate. And secondly, of course, uh, remittances by migrants. No one really thought that when we negotiated NAFTA, remittances were around 4 billion US, and by the early year 2000, it was nearly 20. And there was also, I think, a mistake. We had a very restricted monetary policy, but that's something else. So that would be like the structural reasons uh, beyond our control. But of course, and I have a book where I discuss this with some detail, which is called Por eso estamos como estamos, which I forgot, it's in my hotel, I would have showed it to you. Uh, but, uh, and my wife didn't, saw my, didn't see my message, so she didn't bring it either. So, uh, but it's my fault, of course, not hers. Uh, I have to underscore that. Uh, in this book, I try to argue why. And the reason is basically that we thought that with NAFTA, we had done our homework. And of course, we, had, we have extremely uh, inefficient economic institutions, not only in terms of its basic uh, functionality, in terms of rule of law, property, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but of course all this uh, economic, political economy that has allowed certain individuals to extract very significant rents from the consumers and from the taxpayers. Denise, there is a, uh, yesterday addressed some of the issues. Uh, I would basically argue that uh, if you look at what was open, which is a manufacturing sector, there was a lot of growth taking place and a lot of productivity gains taking place. If you look at the rest of the economy, where the, our economy remains extremely protected and with some very powerful groups capable of extracting rents, uh, the situation was very different. You know well the story, telecommunications, one player, a significant player in telecommunications, two in television. But you could go throughout the whole economy, and even in sectors which you usually find a lot of competition, like in bread, manufacturing of bread, we have one player. I was discussing yesterday with Juan the difference between the largest player, which is Coca-Cola, FEMSA, the rest is amazing, 70% of the market on the hands of the largest one, and 15 in the second one, which is uh, uh, Juan's group. So if you look at almost any sector, that's what you would see. And on top of that, you have an extremely inefficient bureaucratic sector, because there you have your ex rent extractors, which are the bureaucracy in general, and in particular, trade unions. If you look at Pemex, the debt that Mexican society has in favor of debt workers, of, of Pemex workers, because of, because of the pensions they, they've been gaining, which are absolutely ridiculous in terms of at what age they can get their pension, at what level of, of wage compared to the rest of the economy. It's around, it's almost 10% of GDP by now. Uh, and if you look at IMSS, ISTE, and in most uh, large public sector organizations, you have that same problem, and at the same time, extremely inefficient uh, public sector in general. We've been investing billions of dollars in Chicontepec to extract oil, and the oil just doesn't arrive because they've been doing a very poor job. We have bottlenecks created by this lack of capital.
capacity of the public sector and because of how this public sector relates to a private sector, like we have a major bottleneck in gas imports. We have gas in, in, our, in our own, we have shale gas and normal gas that will be enough to produce what we need in Mexico and to export even more, but we still have to import it from the United States because we have rules that have impeded investment in the sector. Uh, not only that, we, we, we weren't even capable of, of, of creating large enough pipes to import at least from the U.S. and profit from the relatively good price in the U.S. and we have to import a percentage of that from Nigeria by boat. So we have extremely inefficient reforms. And let me say a few words about, is Peña going to save Mexico, which was this Time magazine. Uh, Denise Dredd said yesterday was extremely negative. I am much more positive. Uh, there's still a lot, a lot to be seen of how these reforms are, are actually uh, implemented. But the general model is by no means, by no, I have no doubt, is the correct one, which is strengthening the capacity of uh, the state to confront both private monopolist and public sector monopolist. It's not enough, of course, no, never things are enough. It's still yet to be seen how this works. But let's start, for example, with telecommunications. No doubt, you can just follow the share of American Mobile. <laughs> Investors already have anticipated that they're going to pay a, a big price as a result of, of these new reforms. Telecommunication sectors, we will be having a very strong uh, constitutionally autonomous institution in charge of implementing what is an extremely strict uh, law, well, constitutional reform so far, but I'm pretty sure that the law will be relatively similar in terms of enforcing competition in the sector. Maybe it's so harsh that we'll be seeing a problem in terms of not enough investment because neither the largest nor the second one might be interested in investing with such uh, strong rules in competition, what is currently being discussed in the Congress, is extremely harsh. If I were to be a monopolist, I would be very afraid. I have eight seconds. In terms of energy, no, it's already counting in the other direction, sorry. Uh, in, terms of, in terms of energy, the reform is quite significant, and it does include, contrary to what happened 20 years ago, it does include important uh, new institutions for regulating the market, and I could go on with much more detail, but time, of course, has already betrayed me. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Which one of you would like to go next? Well, thank you very much. I, uh, first of all, I think you'll all agree with me how very difficult it is to add after Antonio's excellent presentation and Carlos. <coughs> Uh, to the diagnostic of, of, of NAFTA itself. I think it's absolutely extraordinary that the Center for U.S.-Mexico Studies was initiated at this university. I think recognizing Manuel uh, and, and Carlos as the, the not-so-hidden drivers of this effort, I think, is uh, only fair. And I hope that this very timely initiative really be able to percolate in what is undoubtedly the best timing for discussion on these issues right now. It's just for all the reasons that we've already seen. My comments today are basically related to a private sector perspective of what happened, number one, what really occurred, what was the transformation, number two, number three, what are we missing today, and where are we going from here? That basically from a private sector standpoint, and trying to find those items particularly that are relevant today. If you look at the, uh, at the history of the construction of NAFTA, the private sector role in all three countries was enormously important. I don't think there ever had been or ever has been since as close a collaboration between the three private sectors as occurred during that period. And that collaboration was enormously constructive in terms of bringing forth very innovative solutions, bridging differences, acting as an advisors for all three uh, negotiating teams, and truly becoming a sort of entity in itself that helped enormously uh, construct what NAFTA became. That today is more uh, urgent than ever. 
this initiative that took place, as mentioned by Antonio, of Vice President Biden's visit, where a three uh, a three way dialogue is now initiating between the different private sectors, and that hopefully will construct the the future of this shopping list that Antonio mentioned, which was is very ambitious but very realizable. The fact of the matter is that the role of the private sector has two prongs. It has the prong of being the advisor, and, and advisor in real terms, and it has a prong which is just as important of the internal soul searching of where the opportunities are for each one of these different sectors and, and, and activities. And th both those prongs occurred and occurred very importantly. The second thing that happened also, which I think was very important, is the whole question of innovation. I'll pick on just one subject, but uh, uh, there, was, there had already been established between the Canada, uh, uh, Canada uh, between the U.S. and Chile, uh, previous uh, trade agreement, and between the Chile and uh, between the Canadian and the U.S. trade agreement, a dispute settlement system was already in place. If you take the picture of that dispute settlement system, and you see the picture of what finalized in NAFTA at the time in terms of the creativity of making sure that there was a balanced mechanism, it is truly amazing. And that was done enormously through the efforts of the different legal minds that participated in that with the willingness of really trying to find a true dispute settlement system. Now, if you take that dispute settlement today and you compare it to the dispute settlement that is in place for the Alliance of the Pacific, you'll see just how much progress has been made over the years in terms of really achieving these goals. Sometimes, sometimes we tend to look at what's missing and forget a little bit what was already done. And in that sense, I think what was achieved during NAFTA as a principle has been and is continuing to be strongly, strongly improved upon. And it's happening, and you'll hear more about that today in the, in the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, and you'll hear about it in the Alliance of the Pacific. So this NAFTA was never thought of as something static. It was thought of as something of a work in progress. And in a way, the evolution of the world trade system has helped that progress occur. Now, speaking of transformation, and I'll pick on four specific uh, examples because they just, uh, they, they highlight so much of what really happened. The first one is within Mexico, what you can really call a sort of a silent revolution. Silent, very deep revolution. We went from being a country where things were assembled to a country where things are being manufactured. And that's said very simply. But the value added that that generated for the kind of jobs that that generated, even though diluted among the total population when you look at the big figures, does not take away from the fact that value added jobs mounted on the capability of Mexican workers and their capacity to understand, learn, and follow, the, follow a pattern is nothing short of amazing. When you look at the Bombardier example that Antonio mentioned a little while ago, there is nothing short of 60% integration of manufactured products in the aerospace products that they're exporting and then finalizing assembly with in Europe. Same thing applies to auto parts. The same thing applies all across the board. You need not go very far from here. I mean, here in San Diego, you have a very large company called Solar, which has its way between Tijuana and, and, and San Diego, and where the complementarity of both production capabilities is simply enormous. So it does exist, it does work, and it, it, did, it did happen, this transformation. The second is the, precisely the concept of production sharing complementarity. I mean, you'll do one part here, another part in Mexico, another part in Canada, you bring it all together, finally assemble it wherever it makes sense because it's all about North American competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. And it's amazing how these pieces have fallen into place. I've had the privilege of being on the Caterpillar board for several years now. And the way you manufacture these, this very heavy equipment and where it occurs in terms of what markets it's going to serve has been shifting according precisely to this complementarity. General Electric has the same well has the same list goes on and on and on and on and the fact of the matter is together we make more 
sense in terms of competitiveness than in isolated parts. And that is occurring today. The third, which is very important, a little painful, of course, true. Those who did their homework uh, came out ahead. Those who procrastinated did not. Part of the uh, history of life in business. But for example, in, the, in different industries, the whole consolidation process was enormously accelerated. It was driven by the fact that size does matter, volume does matter, technologies do change, and either you are up to snuff and into the transformation or you're left behind. And uh, a perfect example of that is the auto parts industry in Mexico. 20 years ago, there was 30 or 40 players. Today, there's four or five that represent 90% of the volume. Why? Precisely because size, technology, uh, innovation, all of these elements that are uh, long-term commitment, capability to service, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, are the drivers, whereas before you were basically uh, dependent mostly on the secondary market than on the primary. And the primary today is very important. Mexico this year, if I'm not mistaken, and Carlos, correct me if I'm not mistaken, will become the fourth largest auto producer in the world. Fourth largest. Or fifth. A little bit lower, but well, but it's in there. I mean, fourth it's, uh, exporter. <laughs> or exporter, exporter. I'm sorry. Well, my numbers are never really quite clear, but I mean, it, the, fi the, the, the bottom line is that the transformation has been massive. And it's been massive not only with U.S. manufacturing, it's been massive with European manufacturing, it's been massive with Japanese and Korean manufacturing, using this springboard effect and access to markets. I mean, the new Aguascalientes plant of Mazda is nothing short of impressive by any standard worldwide. And what's even more impressive is not the fact that a new car comes out for the world every, I think, 35 seconds or so. Again, my numbers are probably not right, but they are fast. <laughs> But the bottom line is basically that that car comes with 70% content manufactured in Mexico. That's what is the big difference in the process. And it's not just all the pieces being brought from all over the world. That's the biggest transformation. And that consolidation process meant that if you see the map of Mexican uh, business leadership, the map over 20 years has significantly transformed. And will continue to do so because this is an ongoing process. Finally, the whole concept of the rule of origin. This sort of esoteric subject that, you know, what percentage has to be done where, is really basically uh, the driver behind the whole transformation. The work that was done by the Mexican and U.S. and Canadian private sector, just for example in the automotive or in the textile, in terms of the establishment of the rule of origin, that establishment of where they drew that line and how they accounted for it was exactly what drove that whole integration and that whole transformation. So it is a motor. What are we missing? Well, first of all, let me call it more T. The dispute settlement system, uh, and this happens to anybody who reads a, a contract that he signed 20 years ago, and lived with, he's going to find things that he can improve, I mean, by definition. And I think we should capture the experience of those 20 years to improve the contract. You're not renegotiating it. You're simply making it more efficient. Uh, you're trying to solve the bottlenecks wherever they serviced or didn't service and so on. And, for example, what I mean by more teeth is the dispute settlement system, there's a number of gaps in terms of how it the need to make it more intense, more, more real, more of a solution maker. And that's happening in some, of the other, in some of the other agreements. The other thing we need to do is a simplification process. Obviously, when we cooked up these rules of origin, there was a number, of, uh, quite a bit of skepticism around the table as to who was going to comply and not, and how do we survey it, and how do we make sure that it's real. And are we not, you know, are we not being springboards for others and so on and so forth? A natural concern. And the paperwork that goes into compliance of, of, of rules of origin is absolutely massive. Twenty years later, I am certain there is no doubt we can simplify that process and bring important savings and fluidity to the whole integration process, given the trust that's been developed and that takes me to the third one, which is this whole concept of infrastructure. 
I don't think there's a big driver today in terms of North American competitiveness than improving the border, making our borders efficient. Making a, this does not mean non-compliance. This does not mean getting slack. It means making them efficient, make, using all the newer technologies that exist, all of the different mechanisms of control that exist today to, to make this whole movement of people and goods that much more fluid, that much more efficient. It's very simple. Nothing, nothing beats geography. And our geography has brought Together, and it's given us this enormous opportunity. We should be able to do the pre-clearance of the truck that's leaving from Ottawa or wherever, all the way down to finishing its its, its work in uh, somewhere in Guadalajara or wherever, with a whole system that controls the process and so that does not mean that you have to change and transform and uh, change carriers and uh, check again and what have you. All that is time, money, etc. So the whole process of simplifying what is trying to be done, I think, can be very, uh, very should be achieved and can be achieved. And the whole concept of infrastructure. Arturo, who's here, who was our a brilliant ambassador that we had in, 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 in the last period, it, it, well, said it many, many times. And I mean, the fact of the matter is that we, we, built, we built into NAFTA something we call the NAFTA, uh, the NADBank. Well, the NADBank really, I think, would be hard put to find what it actually did over the last 20 years. I mean, it exists, it was funded. It should have been a springboard for activity and transformation. It hasn't been. Why not recapture and rekindle the idea we had then and use it in a much more efficient fashion? So those are the things that need to be done for. And when you look forward, as you look forward, it really basically, uh, the concept is, it's all about the neighborhood. Uh, the fact of the matter is that North American competitiveness today given the energy transformation, given the people transformation, given all of the resources we've talked about, given the complementarity, given a NAFTA plus, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, North America should see itself as an entity that is capable of competing in the rest of the world and being, of course, a very significant part of that rest of the world. There's very important lessons to be learned from the for the Pacific. I think it really is something you'll enjoy hearing this afternoon. Trans-Pacific Partnership is a great initiative. I think it has all of the inner workings of bringing the rest of the world into these disciplines. It's no longer about tariffs. It's about certainty. It's about complementarity. And that's where I think that we can play a very important role. But it's us Canada, U.S., and Mexico together. And that's where I think the three governments are obviously doing that. The summit of a week ago, the shopping list that you saw a minute ago, which I think is right on and uh, whose elements that we will all be pursuing, and the role of the three private sectors within that. Thank you very much. I just started off right okay. yeah. Thank you. Um, what they're going to have to do is essentially provide a case study, an example of uh, an industry, of a company that's been able to grow and progress during the uh, NAFTA years. I think it's particularly, especially interesting talking about the beef sector. Why? Because one of the things 20 years ago, when you're talking about NAFTA, we tried to identify which would be the losers and which would be the winners. And uh, cattle was considered a loser as far as Mexico is concerned. And what I'll argue today is that uh, far from being a loser, we're probably a winner. The other thing, too, that I'll try to make a point is that uh, I've heard in, in the uh, introduction and even some of the talks here, everybody's talking about technology, 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 and we don't really think of the agriculture sector as a technological sector, but there's a lot of technology that goes into it. And I think one of the other things in terms of innovations, it's innovations not only in technology, but innovations in terms of changing your business model. I think that would be the key point that I want to argue about today is that uh, looking at the company, 
we've changed our business model over time to make us a much more competitive uh, company in the uh, North American context. As you can see, I brought some slides. I decided to leave them in Spanish so to see if everybody really understands it here. Or it's just uh, what I uh, was told, and it may, it may or may not be true. What I wanted to do then is talk a little bit about our experiences, uh, what happened, uh, what lessons we learned, and then some thoughts for the future. If we go back about 20 years ago, when uh, we were negotiating the NAFTA, the livestock sector at cattle was already an open sector. Uh, Luis Tejas, I don't think he's going to be here this afternoon, but Luis really got his start uh, in, uh, being in charge of the importing and bringing in cattle on into Mexico when he worked with uh, Pedro Aspe. Why were we doing it? It was essentially to lower inflation. Policy has tend to be one of looking at uh, the consumers in that time and not uh, producers. You can see down way at the bottom, you see the graph down there, you can see how from 1988 to about 1993, 94, imports of meat really grew. So this, we, this is what we were facing. We're facing a sector that was open. We were very scared about what was happening. And what was our first uh, response? Our first response was to initiate a dumping demand. We did this in 1998. We said that the U.S. was dumping uh, old meat. They were selling below cost, ex uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, just a, a little antidote on that. If you're ever in one of these public audiences and it's 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, you're bored stiff, what you might want to do is count the number of lawyers in there, uh, figure out what they're, uh, you know, how much they're making for not by hours, multiply that, and then divide it by the number of seconds. And uh, you're talking about how many cars were coming out Imagine what the cost of per second of a lawyer is in the dumping demand. Uh, <laughs> just in case you're in, in that type of thing. Well, so we, 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 we initiated the dumping demand. And um, the uh, Secretary of Commerce said that we won, but in, in reality, we really didn't win anything. In fact, we felt that it, um, it really distorted the, the sector. So what was, the, um, what was our answer? What did we have to do? We had to rethink, rethink the business model. We had to redefine ourselves the livestock sector, we ceased to be uh, producers of cattle, producers of pigs, producers of uh, chicken. We decided that we were producers of meat. And that's a very, very important uh, 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 change because it redefines the business model, it redefines our objective. If you look at that graph down there, you can see what our cost and so carne, the, uh, uh, our company costs are in terms of, um, of, of uh, per, per head of cattle compared with what, our, what the costs are in the U.S. for packaging, slaughter and packaging. You can see that when we talk about uh, meat, we define and redefine our thought of what the business model is, what our objective is, we're highly competitive. So I think that's an important thing. The other thing, too, is that as we change our business model, we understand that we have to worry about uh, consumers, we have to worry about food safety. And if you look at uh, on the right-hand side, you, side, you can see all the certificates that we have, and it's not just the USDA. It's the Russians, it's the Japanese, it's the South Koreans. So it's, uh, we've redefined our business model. We've defined, as I'm uh, saying, we defined our business model as not uh, cattle raisers, but meat producers, and then looking at what the, the market's demanding. I think that this, again, is a very, very important point. So what, uh, what happened then, look at this, uh, again, the, the graphs here. Um, we've turned what was a deficit in 1994 into uh, positive um, in terms of balance of payment for, for capital. So I think the thing, look at the, the, the graph on the left-hand side. And if you can really see it, if you look at the, um, uh, the, the, the sort of the light blue uh, uh, part on the graph, the exports, those are uh, feeder cattle, the live uh, cattle that uh, we feed and then uh, slaughter. If you look at the number of feeder cattle that we export, that's pretty much stayed the same. But if you look at the uh, dark blue, that's meat that we're exporting. You see the, what the change in the model. We turned from a, in, from a country that exported uh, feeder cattle and imported meat to a country that continues to export feeder cattle, but is a country that's also exporting meat. We defined, redefined uh, the model. And you can see on the, the graph on the right-hand side, it, uh, it, looks, it looks all, all together. So what does this all mean? What do we think? In, whoop. What does this all mean? We, we, we feel that um, th at this point of time, there's, there's a change in the dynamics of, of, of the world economy. We think that the uh, livestock sector 
which 20 years ago was considered to be a loser. Not only is it not a loser, but we think that it's a sector that can really turn around and be a leading sector in, uh, in pushing and developing the Mexican economy. I'm sorry for all the, the, all the people in the automobile industry, the tech industry. We feel that the livestock industry can be one of the leaders in, in the economy. We see the demand in terms of meat around the world is, is important. But more important, what's Mexico? We have, uh, we're, we're uh, hoof and mouth free. We don't have uh, mad cow disease in the country. We have a very strong uh, Secretary of Agriculture in terms of the phytosanitary uh, aspects. I think it's probably well, it's just as good as anyone anywhere in the world. We've got a number of policies that are pushing uh, developing the sector. So we see that it can be a, a leading sector, and we're talking about moving to what we call uh, a, a multi-sector model that will uh, push and develop Mexican, Mexican agriculture. In terms of uh, Sucarne, uh, the company of which I'm a board member and a, s and a small shareholder, and just a little bit about us, again, I think that we've been one of the leaders in terms of um, redefining the business model. In terms of uh, our, over the 20 years of NAFTA, our sales have grown uh, 44 times. We're only twice, Carlos, we're only twice as big as a leading component. We, we, we're, we're working on it, you know. <laughs> we want to be the Carlos Slim of, uh, of the meat industry, but, you know, give, 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 give us time. Uh, but we've grown 44 times in terms of our sales. But I think the, the key thing is what, what, what's been dri driving the growth, the ability to change. If you look at the graph on the, uh, the right-hand side, we started out 20-some uh, years ago, and we were uh, producing and uh, uh, raising cattle, slaughtering it, and selling carcasses. We changed. We changed from carcasses to bof box beef. That was an important, uh, important change. And that meant that from, uh, w it really gave uh, significant uh, impetus to the growth of the company, and it changed the business model in Mexico. If you look at, you go to Mexico today, you hardly see anybody selling uh, carcasses, or half carcasses, you see selling box beef. Now, if you look at that graph very closely, you see towards the uh, very to the far right-hand side, you see that now we're looking at uh, more giving further process into the uh, into the animal, into the meat. So we're moving then from uh, we went from carcasses to box beef to further processing, more value-added, more consumer-oriented uh, meat development. So that's what again the I think the key technological change here is really the business model. Business model. We're, we're, we we do do a lot of we you know we're we're as efficient as anybody else. We we invest a lot. We're investing right now in uh, the area of Tor Torreon, which should be what we consider will be the largest and most efficient uh, plant in North America. Uh, we're already the fifth largest uh, uh, cattle feeder in the world, not just in America in the world. But this but it's based on the business model. And how have we changed our business model? A number of things we look at the the uh, the animal we look at it as not one solid animal we look at it as the composition of a number of cuts and pieces of meat and what we end up doing maybe it's my ba my banking bag I say we're arbitraging the meat. Uh, we're exporting uh, high value cuts and importing low value cuts on the world market certainly is the leading import of uh, lips for example because there's the demand for that in the Mexican market so this is what we've done. We, we've re redefined the business model, but we've gone even further. We're now the, in Sucarne, we're now the uh, leading uh, importer of meat. We're the leading exporter of uh, meat. We're exporting to the U.S., of course. We're exporting to Japan, to uh, Russia, to Africa, uh, among other, other countries. So again, the vision of what the, the model is. And we're also then uh, very much involved in terms of uh, pork and uh, poultry. So we feel that then, you know, there are a number of uh, successful cases in the, Mexican, in the Mexican economy. We feel there's much more that can be done, much more that uh, can be developed. We've, one of the things we stay, see right now is really the development of the greenhouse, of the horticulture industry, and the development uh, through, through, um, through greenhouses, which has been very, very important. So what does this all mean? We, we see, we think that um, in, in, in agriculture, especially in livestock, from 20 years ago, we were scared and worried producers. We moved from being a scared and worried producer to a successful competitor. But, and this is where I probably disagree with uh, some, of, uh, some of my colleagues and some of the people, uh, Dr. Ortiz Mena, in the morning. We see that a lot of the synergies 
that are available that NAFTA offers to us, we really haven't uh, taken advantage of as we should and we can and we can in terms of agriculture. So we see that this is, you know, moving forward, this is where we've got to look at what are the synergies that are available. And this becomes more and more important in, in the context of the change in the structure of uh, the world trade, uh, especially in agriculture products. So what's, what's our thinking? We feel that one of the things we've got to look at now is somewhat of a trilateral uh, agricultural policy. You want to call it a common agricultural policy, that's fine. But we've got to look at somewhat of a common or trilateral agricultural policy where our agricultural policies are not conflicting, but an agricultural policy that really complements each other. If you, you, if you look at the chart there, you know, the graph there, we talk about um, uh, the development, especially in Mexico. But I want to make the point because uh, I'm here in the United States. You, uh, uh, my feeling, and you look at it, the U.S. agricultural sector is, is stagnated. It's, uh, it's stalled. Agriculture policy in this country is based on protectionism. Uh, you look at the cool, the country of labeling, country of origin labeling. Our view is, is, is protectionism, raw protectionism. This is the U.S. agriculture policy. And we feel that you know, we have to make changes in Mexico, but you have to make changes here in the U.S. And so this is why we're talking about uh, a change a uh, trilateral, trilateral agricultural policy. And we're looking, so going forward, again, what we feel is that we have to move, move from being competitors to being partners in agriculture. We feel that there's a lot of opportunities there that haven't been taken, taking events where there's a lot of complementarity that's in, in agriculture uh, that we have to take advantage of. Um, the, I, I don't remember if you, that's if you mentioned um, labor in one of your questions. But uh, you know, the labor issues, what's happening in uh, the, the meat plants in the U.S.? The meat plants in the U.S. are Mexican uh, uh, workers, and a lot of them, as we recognize, you know, are not completely here legally. The labor uh, component, we need the development of labor. We need the development of jobs in the Mexican, in the Mexican market. We feel this can move forward. But we see this then as the, the ability, again, as I said, to move from a competitor to partners. We see that this is a, we need to move and look at a common or uh, trilateral agricultural policies where ad policies aren't conflicting, policies aren't uh, 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 supporting protectionism. The policies are one that support uh, 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 partnership and where we can be uh, partners uh, forward for an uh, equitable uh, development in the North American agricultural economy. Thank you. <laughs> well, Mark, I guess it's my turn to moderate the discussion. Uh, it's been a fascinating series of presentations from, and wonderful from Carlos's overview of sort of macroeconomic indicators to Juan's discussion of the role of uh, the private sector in these negotiations and the way that it has impacted the formation of NAFTA to the actual, the practicalities of what competition means and looks like within an industry. I mean, I, as an academic, I had no idea that things could be that complicated. And as an academic, I confront the question of, you know, what am I going to ask uh, that hasn't already been answered? Uh, so I'm going to start with a typical <laughs> scholarly ploy, which is to ask an impossible and probably useless question, but one that I think is <laughs> maybe significant in some way. And this is the following. What about cause and effect? We've been speaking of the NAFTA era, as though everything that's happened within the last 20 years in this trilateral economy has been a consequence of NAFTA, and I think it's worth asking, you know, what about other factors? What really was the specific role of NAFTA and that uh, treaty? We can speak of globalization over the same 20 years. You spoke of geography and the neighborhood uh, that maybe made it possible and other kinds of factors that might have been at work. So let's just sort of differentiate between the cause and effect relations of NAFTA on these situations and also sort of the other complicating factors that might have led to some movements in this direction without a NAFTA, theoretically at least. So that said, um, let me observe that it's been said that NAFTA you know, increases efficiency through competition. Uh, competition creates winners and losers. And Carlos, let me begin with you. Um, who would qualify as the losers in Mexico uh, and what 
is their attitude toward NAFTA? I mean, it may be that in this room people embrace NAFTA, but maybe outside the room in other parts of Mexico, that's not always the case. So what would be your judgment about that? Luther's opinions, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll answer both. Uh, first, what is very interesting is that in terms of public opinion, NAFTA in Mexico is very popular. And that's a very big difference with the U.S. In the U.S. you have a relatively negative opinion of NAFTA. In Mexico, starting in the election of 94, Otomo Cárdenas stopped talking about NAFTA because he realized that people was cherishing one of the uh, areas where for there being a lot of winners, which is a consumer. I mean, people want to buy a, a cheap television or whatever, and it's very been very clear to make consumers that it's being associated with NAFTA. I won't say it was caused with NAFTA. I'll go to your first large question at the end of my answer, but it certainly was associated with NAFTA. The fact that the economy was open created an amazing consumer surplus in many areas, and I think that they've been the winners. Who've been uh, the losers? Well, the losers were all those sectors, uh, manufacturing in, in particular, that were unprepared for such a swift open. Because contrary to other reforms we've done in Mexico, including energy reform, we've always been, do we, all, we tend to do reforms so slowly that at the end their impact might not be as, as important as we were expecting. In this case, it was an extremely swift change. It started before, as Kenneth very clearly show it for the case of energy. For in the case of, of meat, it started really in, with GATT and then several other openings of the, of, of, of the frontier. But even with GATT, what had been an extremely closed economy suddenly became a really relatively quickly open economy and Kenneth very quickly explained us how difficult that is at the beginning. And there were many, if you look at the exports of, of, of total exports of, of meat, most of them are from Sucarne. <laughs> 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 so, in fact, <laughs> the success stories of Sucarne and many other corpses uh, <laughs> were left behind. So, uh, <laughs> they, they get dead cattle. <laughs> <laughs> I was referring to them, of course. So, there was a significant change in the structure of the Mexican industry, and that led to many sectors. The most evident one is textiles, where a lot of businessmen got broke. And if you look at terms, in terms of employment, it's very interesting. If you look at the total employment in the manufacturing sector, 94, uh, 2013, is more or less the same level than before. I mean, there was a lot of new investment, extremely productive, this investment with not so many workers. And there were a lot of firms that were destroyed and a lot of employment was lost. So I think that would be the main losers. But the most interesting argument is probably what you... The, 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 your, your first question, I think, is very interesting to answer this second question. Of, because there's still a debate in the academia related to two arguments. One is, yeah, yeah, NAFTA was great, but the trend was already there because of technological changes, globalization in general, exports were growing from Mexico to the U.S. and vice versa, private NAFTA, etc. You do see, however, and from Mexican perspective, one of the big changes of NAFTA is that we used to have a deficit with the U.S. and very quickly we had a surplus. Difficult to, 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 to isolate like that. In 94, in 1995, one year after, after NAFTA, we had this major currency crisis and the relative prices of the two economy were transformed dramatically. So it's difficult to argue in a very systematic way, but still what we do, we, we can see is that the, uh, what had been a chronic deficit of Mexico became a chronic surplus. So that tends to show that the fact that there was so uncertainty, and that's what NAFTA gives, contrary to general globalization, is that it created the, the, the proper incentives to commit yourself. If you would have asked Sukarne to invest, they invested. With, with, with some clear rules of the game, they would have invested much less because you never know when suddenly some meat producer in the U.S. gets angry and they have to try to close you the border or whatever. So I think that it's difficult to, 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 to make a precise argument, but there are many evidence that NAFTA did create a different mechanism for, 
for, for complementing the two economies or the three economies that without NAFTA it would have been extremely difficult. Could I, thank you. Um, could I add something on that? Yes, you can. Yeah, I, I think w one of the things we're talking about winners, losers, NAFTA, one of the things that, that I don't see people discussing is the accompanying legislation. You mentioned earlier about the, the structure, the monopolies or the oligopolies in, in, in the country. Uh, the, the accompanying legislation was never really there in NAFTA, uh, and uh, at least in the, uh, specifically in the agricultural sector, and that created a lot of distortions. Uh, we, the opening was not logical. Uh, we had some sectors that uh, further down the, the value chain were open before the, uh, uh, the suppliers. So I think that, that that's an important point, and I think that should be looked at later on today when you're talking about the TPP. We're we really going to align policy with the, the negotiations. Well, let me follow up with you, and then I want to turn to you on. Uh, um, you mentioned accompanying legislation or regulations and pr protectionism in the U.S. economy. What do you think is the state of political will to bring about sort of uh, changes that would maximize the benefits of NAFTA over the next 20 years when we come back and talk about it again? You're talking about the U.S. or Mexico? Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm talking about all three <laughs> countries, but you mentioned the United States, and um, so I'd like to ask you to comment on that. Well, I'm not the you know, expert on, on the U.S., but I, I don't really see that in agriculture, I really don't see their, uh, their, their that much uh, uh, willingness to uh, move forward. Uh, we look again. You mentioned one about the dispute settlement. One of the areas is phytosanitary. We st still see a lot of problems in the phytosanitary. You know, the, the question that some, and, and we imagined 20 years ago that they would be scientifically based question is, who's science? Uh, you know, you have uh, the science and you have the Mexican science, and you know, it's uh, completely different. Uh, it's the, uh, so it, that, that hasn't really been there. And again, going back to the cool, going back, there was an interesting uh, comment from the, uh, one of my former colleagues in Rabobank Bank about the uh, inability of the U.S. Uh, livestock sector to move forward according to the men. So I don't really see that there's a lot of will, will in the U.S. Uh, agricultural sector. And if you look at changes the changes you've had in the Farm Bill that was just recently passed in the U.S. It was that were driven not by the agricultural sector, but were driven by uh, budgetary considerations. Well, just to make the point, uh, as I turn to you, Juan, is that when NAFTA was negotiated right after the end of the Cold War, the United States was the number one economy in the world. It was very open, et cetera. It was, um, in fact, a participant in this process. Twenty years later, the United States and the world economy looks very different. Uh, and there are these protectionist tendencies, not to mention congressional paralysis. So just to say it, it's sort of for the sake of the audience, the 800-pound gorilla not in the room is the United States in this sense. So my friend, <laughs> let me ask you, you, you mentioned sort of changes in dispute settlement. What do you, um, it sounds reasonable and sounds practical. Um, are there obstacles to achieving these changes? You know, within NAFTA, when it was first put in place, there was created, uh, I think it was called an executive committee or a follow-up committee, that was charged with the responsibility of making adjustments as we went along and improving on it. And for reasons, as Kenneth was just mentioning right now, a lot of the work thereafter was dropped by all three countries. Uh, 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 us within Mexico also had a lot of legislation that needed to be upgraded and up uh, and identified. The thing applied both in Canada and the U.S. So uh, the 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 blueprint is there. I mean, the the structure is in place, and what we need to do is mobilize the will, the the uh, to 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 make these corrections. They're 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 pretty uh, obvious. Uh, uh, the, you know, compliance is one. I mean, uh, we all know about the fact that uh, trucking has been a, a source of conflict between the U.S. and Mexico since the beginning, and it's a question of compliance. Everyone should stick to their deals, and, uh, and we should make the adjustments as we go along that are necessary. If that is bought as a concept for the North American competitiveness, and that's the key to the element, then we can do all these changes. And you were saying about losers and winners. It's really quite, it's almost uh, painful, but the fact of the matter is there are those who did their soul searching, like Kenneth's example of soul searching, I think, has impressed us perfectly clear. You had to rethink your game plan, you had to transform what you were doing, and you had to 
do it with a sense of urgency. And those who didn't, the, and uh, within each sector, there were two parties, those who did and those who didn't. The winners are the ones who did, the losers are the ones who didn't. It, it practically works all across every activity that you, that you look at. In one of those, uh, you know, consolidation processes, we all know the legalese for that. There's the mergerer and there's the mergeree. <laughs> and you want to be on the mergerer side and not on the mergeree side. And, uh, and the same thing applied really basically across the board. And, and you see that same transformation in the U.S. and in Canada. So I think we have a very unique opportunity because the momentum is there. The history of the results is very clear. The comp the, it is not that complex, and basically it's driven by the convenience of all three countries to be able to face the rest of the world in a more competitive fashion. Right? Well, that sounds very persuasive. Uh, but Did I convince you? Let me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but a couple of things that you said that needed to be done to do with the border and infrastructure and. Gee, at least in the standpoint of U.S. political system, those are very complicated. The infrastructure could be very expensive, highways, you know, um, all kinds of you know, informatics, this, that, and the other thing to connect. It's hard to drive a truck from Oaxaca to Nova Scotia because of so many regulations and differences in the roads and the size of the rigs, et cetera. Um, and another question about the border, I mean, that is a really hot issue. Mm -hmm. in the United States, and it's one that doesn't lend itself to sort of econometric calculations easily. Well, I think the issue of the border has, of course, been, and, you know, being in San Diego today, I mean, it's a perfect example of what we're discussing. The fact of the matter is that the border has been a, a sore point for many, many uh, generations, and the fact of the matter is that it does have solutions. There are solutions to a much more efficient border crossing system for both people and, uh, and, and products. And those solutions have to do with technology, they have to do with infrastructure, they have to do with investment. And if we give it the proper priority, I am sure that we can achieve the, the, the covering the different sensitivities on both sides. And I won't debate the sensitivities. I think everyone is entitled to his sensitivities. But they can be covered and they can be achieved and yet you cannot become, it be not a handicap but actually a big asset, because our big asset, as I repeat, is geography. And you see it, for example, here in San Diego, in a few weeks, we, uh, construction of this terminal in Otay will be starting. It's a perfect example. I mean, it'll, it'll allow the crossing back and forth in the border for airline passengers in a much more efficient way. Okay. It's taken several years to get all the regulatory compliance requirements in place. <coughs> And uh, they're now in place, and construction will be starting in a couple of weeks. Well, it's going to completely transform the logistics of people moving back and forward, and it's also going to have the opportunity of building around San Diego a, an Asian capability, a South American capability, and, and of course, a much greater uh, crossover back and forth for tourism and economy and so on. So I, I just use it as an example. It was, it's been an enormously complex initiative to put in place, but it's now in place. And I'd just like to mention something because I think it's, uh, well, it sounds a little romantic, but it, it actually is true. The, 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 the one who did the project, the, 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 the architect has passed away, very well-known Mexican architect by the name of Ricardo Legorreta, greatly admired. It's the first case that a pr project of this sort goes to the San Diego Board of, a, I don't know the name of the, of, this, of the structure, but I mean the ones who have to approve, unanimously approved, and the title of it, I think, is very beautiful. It's called The Gateway to the Californians. And I think that was, that was his last uh, name that he put on the project. And I think it says a world about what we, can, we are able to do. Carlos, let me come back to you on one of the points you made about China, and this is the rest of the world economy. But um, do you think that the impact of China and its, its, uh, its deflection of trade in some senses from NAFTA, that that process is declining now, that the, um, that the NAFTA market is becoming strong enough and robust enough of itself that there will no longer be such distortions, if that's what they are? I wouldn't call them it was just that in the model they were not inside 
the equation and suddenly someone brings this into the world and things changed. But no doubt the relative price of, of, of labor and of energy and of transport are transforming that equation very quickly. Uh, we all know about the energy revolution in the U.S. where you can buy gas at 3.5, whatever, and in China, Japan, it's 14 or 20. That in itself is transforming certain parts of the industry. The wage differential between Mexico and, and China has, has diminished. It's not good news for Mexican work. It basically means that their salary hasn't improved much in the last 20 years, but now that they've more or less equated, certain products are easier to make in Mexico than in China. And as Juan mentioned, and I did not, but when, when exports start to rebound again in the year 2003, it was because we changed the whole logic of how we were integrated into the NAFTA economy, and instead of only assembling, we start manufacturing. And if you add the two things, you start having more clout to try to recapture some of the, of the, of the, of the market that was lost by all actors against what because you saw in the graph, Mexico was the, the country that l lost less. Canada, Japan, all of them lost even more access to the uh, U.S. market than Mexico. But finally, time is very short, there's a big demographical change. I mean, the policy of one child is creating such an acute demographic curve in, the, in, in, in China. I don't know, recall the precise uh, number but very quickly the, the, the workforce will stop growing and Mexico Canada, and the United States have a much uh, softer... Maybe I can improvise a number for you. <laughs> <laughs> Please do. And, I, uh, and, I'll, t and I'll, I'll say thanks. <laughs> Forget about the fact. You, you quote him. <laughs> so uh, clearly that structural change should lead to an easier integration between the three countries. But let's see if we do all the homework that has to be done. Because nothing is automatic. The geography is there, and it helps. But without NAFTA, I think we would, be, we would have been much less integrated. And without proper infrastructure, we'll, we won't profit as much as we could. You, you mentioned uh, China. Let me uh, I get my two cents in here, too. You mentioned China. And you were talking about the you know, Mexico. Uh, being less affected compared to some other ones. But you've got to remember that the Chinese have invested significantly in Mexico. They've also changed their model. So you see a lot of in the maquiladora type of segments. The other thing, too, for example, is that, um, again, going back to the agriculture sector, when they purchased, the Chinese company purchased Smithfield, the U.S. Uh, pork company, Smithfields, uh, they automatically became the largest uh, pork pr uh, uh, hog producer in Mexico through their joint ventures. So, again, you've, you've got the, the if I look at China, Chinese uh, is not just uh, competing, but rather it's also as partners or investing in the country to stimulate the force in that sense. Well, I think that's an important comment that the idea is not for North America to be a closed block in terms of competing with the rest of the world, but a more effective and competitive block. If in fact, many of the recommendations that have emerged here are put into effect. If there is sufficient political will, again, a point I want to emphasize. Uh, then indeed, this may well be a moment of great opportunity, but we've got to seize it, and we've got to be able to do so, and we've got to do it sensibly and effectively and willfully and in full partnership with each other. I think that's what I draw from this panel. I thank you all very much. I thank, thank you. you guys for a terrific presentation. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> Peter? Yeah, I'm sorry, I kept that. I, I want to get my there's, there's actually um, question and answers from the audience, so you might want to stay put. Just oh, we're not done yet. <laughs> no, we get to ask questions. Are, do I'm you sure take are, the audiences? Are, 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 are you going to take the questions? No, you are, Peter. Oh, I'm kidding. <laughs> so, all right, it's time for me to be quiet and for you guys to speak up. So We have some helpers in the audience that will go yeah. around with a microphone. We're also taking okay. some questions up via yeah, email. Hey. Right there, we need a And microphone. if somebody um, asks a question in Espanol, and uh, Peter, you want to translate it, perhaps, uh, if it's in Espanol, and um, if we can't hear the question, you might want to repeat it. Could you talk about uh, measures of well-being uh, as a result of NAFTA, um, measures of, um, of uh, uh, family income? I'm, I'm thinking particularly in Mexico, uh, family income, wealth, uh, uh, health attainment, education attainment? 
Juan. <risa> You want me to come make some up? up. <laughs> you want some numbers? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there's just a very obvious logical question. You recall that within NAFTA there were two side agreements, uh, environmental and, and uh, labor. Both of them uh, uh, triggered a further compliance within each one of the sectors in terms of the application of different measures and different quality of workmanship and different quality of, uh, at the workplace and social responsibility within the communities and so on. And if you look at across the board at those winners that we were talking about, there's not a single one in that list of winners that is not keenly aware of the need to uh, improve and uh, strengthen the quality of the workplace and the quality of the relationship as a measure of competitiveness, also as a measure of social responsibility, but as a truly a measure of competitiveness. And you can go through all the examples. You can think of everything from exercise at the workplace to clinics to education, higher education. For example, uh, the, the, the Tecnológico de Monterrey and the work that large corporations are doing with Tecnológico de Monterrey to de dedicate careers to fine-tuning careers to their different needs of different companies and so on, and creating the opportunity is is so real. It's it's, a, and the same thing applies to a lot of basic primary school requirements in each one of the communities. So you can't give an across the board uh, uh, number or figure. You really have to understand that the relationship with the people within the organization is a very key element of competitiveness and quality of, of workmanship. And that to be able to achieve those numbers that we were talking about, the ones are the ones who have taken that on strongly. To give you an idea, uh, without very sp a lot of information, because I don't have the exact if I would have brought my book, I would have known <laughs> that, but. And, and sold the book issue. too. And sold at least one book. Uh, <laughs> But the, basically, as you saw in the last graph I presented, Mexican economy grew more or less as the U.S. and Canadian. During the good years, it grew more. In the bad years, it grew less. Of course, we still have a, a larger demographical growth. Our GDP per capita growth in these last 20 years have been very small, 0.4% or something like that, very, very small. So in a country that is unequal, as we all know, that means that NAFTA hasn't had the, the, the power that some people expected in terms of alleviating poverty from the worst of. If you look at Conevals, we have this great institution called Consejo Nacional de Evaluación Coneval, which publishes very precise uh, figures on poverty. If you look, for example, from the year after the crisis of 95, crisis of 2009, the percentage of Mexican in poverty had been diminishing. Of course, with a crisis of 2009, because it had an, a serious impact first, prior to the crisis of 2009, but because of the increase of the price of food, and then because of the crisis, poverty stopped diminishing and started growing again, and uh, continued to diminish slightly in the last year, according to the figures. If you look at the Gini index, uh, which you all know measures inequality, highest, the number, the most unequal uh, society. Uh, the Gini index in Mexico has improved in four points, which is not a lot. It's even, it's, it's barely nothing. But still, you show a, there, there's like a slightly improvement in that direction. I'm not saying it's because of NAFTA. I'm just saying in these last 20 years, that's what you've seen. You, if you look at, 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 at certain other indicators, for example, the percentage of Mexicans that have access to uh, water, electricity, television, Do those things have improved, I wouldn't say dramatically, but there's been an improvement. Uh, if you look at some of the aggregate indexes in terms of child mortality and, and, and maternal mortality have improved, they're still high for a country with a level of GDP per capita, but they've improved. And of course, if you look at violence, it has has, has an amazing toll in the, terms of, in the terms of well-being in certain parts of Mexico, and especially in certain ages. Young, young people in Mexico have a large 
it's, it's the first cause of, of death among them is murder, no? So, but it would merit a much more detailed discussion, but uh, uh, data hasn't been the disaster its critics had claimed. It hasn't been the panacea uh, some of its defenders were claiming, no? Yes, sir. A little bit about NAFTA from the U.S. perspective. Uh, I was working in the embassy when, in Mexico City when we were negotiating the NAFTA. And um, I remember that one of the primary goals that was always not talked about publicly, but uh, very, very important for the United States, probably the most important aspect for the United States, was uh, how we could improve our relations with Mexico. because. In the uh, 70s and 80s, our relations uh, were not very good, and President Reagan was once asked, uh, this is in the pre-Berlin Wall days, uh, who are the two most important countries for the United States? And he said, Russia because they could annihilate us, and Mexico because they can annoy us to death. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so um, I think NAFTA, uh, you can debate it, and it has been much more successful from an economic perspective for Mexico than for the United States. But I would argue that we have benefited even more because notwithstanding some of the current problems that we have in our bilateral relations, they have improved tremendously over the last 20 years, and I think we're much closer as, uh, as two countries than we were. So I think the from our perspective, the, uh, the, the closer ties now and not having Mexico in the United Nations, the OAS, all of the international forums constantly on the opposite side and pulling together has been a very, very important aspect of this. Thank you. Is <coughs> a comment in the middle of the room, sir? Yes. Oh, no, okay. <laughs> Excuse me? I've been trying. Okay. Well, you are certainly right in terms of electronics and software and all those things, generally speaking. Not in automobile and other areas where innovation has been moving to Mexico. Uh, I really don't know why it wasn't captured by, by Mexican films. We started with some assemblies just like China. As you are well aware, Foxtrot, uh, these large Taiwanese companies started assembling a lot of things in Mexico. And they, they move into China first because of price, and then they capture some of that development much better than, our, than, than us. As far as I understand, in states like Jalisco and Aguascalientes, they are trying to yes. uh, create the proper institutional conditions to recapture some of that investment, profiting in the case of Jalisco from the fact that they have a large Hewlett, Park, Hewlett uh, facility there where the old assemblers of some of these things that then moved to China. There's this Mexican software company, how is it called, uh, Juan? Uh, Compañía de Software Mexicana. Sofitec. Sofitec. Relatively successful, but they are just peanuts. So, minute. So, uh, nano minute. So, uh, you certainly would need to, to create a more, I mean, I don't think that the, these things usually come as a result of policy. Uh, state <laughs> capacity to actually in 
impulse to, 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 to drive the things is quite low. You need to increase the institutional and ca human capital capacities of, of the country. And in principle, uh, President Peña has uh, is in very interested in this area. They say they will spend, instead of 0.5 of GDP in, in science and technology, move to one point of GDP by the end of the sexenio, whether that would be enough and whether I have no idea, but uh, uh, that's at least what, at least they now have that in the, ra in the screen and think they should move forward. I think that a lot of the problem comes from the lack of capacity, entrepreneurial capacity in Mexico in those areas. One of the arguments I do in my book, uh, Telmex, America Mobile is one of the few large firms that do not publish how much they spend in innova innovation in science and technology. Most companies presume that, no, show off that. It's a very important figure. My intuition is they spend more in lawyers than in innovation and desarrollo. <laughs> Why? Because when you have a, a monopoly or a dominant position that has to be defended through political and legal clout, that's much more it's a much better investment than the uh, uncertainties of innovation and development. Still, some of the large consumer firms in Mexico, like Bimbo, Lala, Alpura, that profited from the fact that they had these protected markets and then grew, 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 and not against those that grow with competition, but those that grow from a dominant position, but even then are slowly starting to uh, invest more investment in, in, in the investigation and desarrollo. So I think that it's going to be a slow process as long as we don't have entrepreneurial drivers in Mexico. And second problem is the distance between university and, and businessmen in Mexico, which is dramatically because, because of ideology, because of the way they are funded. So that makes that development, this is a counterexample of that, much more difficult. Imagine just the budget of the UNAM compared to this budget and how much they actually live with businessmen. Sorry. I'm going to ask you a question related to your presentation and a response. I, I got the impression that you said, said that consolidation and size would improve innovation and change. Is that did oh, absolutely? Understand uh, that correctly? Yes, uh, yes, yes. I think that uh, part of the experience within the private sector, and Carlos knows this very well, so does Kenneth. I mean, basically, by subjects, you need your spark plugs. You need the people who are the drivers and the ones who really know their issue and who now know how to reach out and find on the other side the people who can pick up on the same subject and follow up on it and then do the And in this case, the case of innovation, I think it's you put on a very important point. It's one of the areas where we have the greatest opportunity and one of the areas where precisely centers like this uh, can identify the key players on both sides and try to bring together a, a, a game plan, what you called a business, a, a, a redefine the game plan, because there's no doubt that together we can do it at a lesser price, at a quicker pace, and probably with deeper knowledge and innovation than if we did it elsewhere. And I, and I don't think that realization is yet in place, and it should be, and I think it's doable. And so coming back to your question, Peter, yes, the, it, consolidation doesn't mean that everything has to be done by one big company. I mean, it, has, it means it has to be done in an efficient fashion by those players who actually contribute. So that, that it doesn't isolate the small and medium enterprise from it. On the contrary, there's a trickle-down effect. The auto industry is probably the most obvious. Here you have this enormous assembly plant, but you've got 30 or 40 large suppliers installed right next to it, who in turn have 30 or 40 suppliers installed right next to it. There's a whole chain event that is important. And innovation, this, exactly the same thing applies. Got the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> I had the microphone. I'm in the driver's seat. <laughs> well, I uh, was born in the Philippines, but I live in the United States. So I'm not annoyed at Mexico at all. <laughs> okay. My question relates to uh, the comment made about the wage differential being dramatically changed between Mexico and China. And it's really true. Now, if you look at 
not only wage differential, but if you look at the total cost structure, including transportation, yeah. clearance, and customs, and, and all that kind of good stuff, insurance and everything, Mexico may be at an advantage, actually, if not now, but maybe in the next couple of years. Does it make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Now, the, the question I have is, given this great transformation, what government and or private initiatives are taking place right now in Mexico, and to that extent, NAFTA, to take advantage of this transformation, because it looks like China is ahead of the game by investing in Mexico at all, right now, like Smithfield, for example, that you mentioned. So I would appreciate your comment in this regard. One of the things, just going to your first point, it's definitely true. Um, uh, we've done some looking at some uh, cost structures in Nuevo Laredo and the maquilador industry. And uh, even at this time right now with some of the heavy industry, we're much more competitive because of logistics and timing than the Chinese. Uh, in terms of what's going on, what the government's doing, and uh, you, you know, early we heard uh, about the, uh, so the clusters in agriculture are developing the policies, moving to agriculture clusters, then look for the synergies, the innovation, and the ability then to uh, capitalize on what the, the country has, the, uh, the, the technology that's available, the development of technology, the adop uh, adoption of technology, as well as then the, the, la the labor component, and then put that in, in, terms, of, um, in terms of the logistics uh, uh, advantages. I think that, at least in agriculture, that's where the country, that's where we're going. Let me, if I may add just, Peter, to that, I think it would be very interesting for all the public here to have the list, the shopping list that Antonio mentioned, because he ticked through them very quickly in terms of the results of the Toluca meeting. And yet there's eight or nine, Antonio, there's eight, eight or nine very specific issues that address exactly what you're saying. In other words, what are we going to do about it? So yes, these advantages are there. What, what needs to be done to really capitalize them and really trigger them off? And the list is right there. And I think the fact that the list exists, that it was built into a consensus, and the fact that there is now a body of advisory role structured, all of that is progress in terms of really tr being able to address that. And then it depends on the rest of the participants, particularly the three private sectors, to become involved in that body and supply the kind of support and information and solutions that can trigger uh, and speed up that whole process. So I think that list is very important to, to have top of mind. You know? There's a question over here. Um, Sorry. Buenos días. Para ser eh, en español, para ser parte de esta eh, reunión binacional. Eh, dos, dos aspectos. Eh, me parece que después de 20 años, eh, las distintas formas de colaboración entre eh, los tres países, pero sobre todo entre México y Estados Unidos, eh, han avanzado. Eh, efectivamente, se creía que por el lado mexicano eh, la integración económica eh, estaba el acuerdo, pero sí hemos avanzado. En estos 20 años, el acuerdo económico también trajo nuevas formas de colaboración y creo que es momento de repasar esas formas de colaboración eh, y acuerdos, eh, incluso a escala más pequeña, a nivel fronterizo. Creo que ahí eh, la región frontera norte tiene mucho que aportar a esta nueva forma, a este, eh, estos nuevos 20 años, esta nueva, esta nueva eh, visión que podríamos tener sobre el Telecán. Ese por un lado. Y eh, por otro lado, eh, volver a repensar esta idea de los ganadores y perdedores. Las etiquetas no me gustan mucho. Se habló de perdedores y ganadores. Creo que muchos sectores eh, que no eran considerados ganadores ganaron. Creo que regiones que no eran consideradas ganadoras ganaron incluso por eh, la inclusión de China a una eh, apertura comercial. Creo que ese es, eh, son dos puntos importantes a reflexionar de nuevo. Las formas de colaboración que se fueron implementando en estos 20 años y eh, repensar nuevamente entre los ganadores y los perdedores. ¿Qué opinan eh, respecto a nuestros panelistas? Final comments, on <coughs> questions of collaboration, and we 
means of stimulating collaboration and the relationship between winners and losers and in some ways sort of keeping everybody in the game. <coughs> oh, make, make up some figures. <laughs> I'll make up some figures. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, there, you know, the menu of the diff diverse forms of joint venture and collaboration that have occurred is so broad. It really is incredibly creative. And it applies from the clusters to the regions to the production to the, I mean, there has been some trigger of, it, of, of ways of, of, of uh, facing this competition and this transformation that are really very impressive. And we could tick off a whole bunch of them, but it applies all across the board. I think that the most important item, though, is the sense of awareness. And uh, that has grown across uh, all three countries in terms of what we mean to each other and what we could mean to each other. And that's where I think we all could play a very significant role in terms of identifying those opportunities. You were mentioning uh, earlier, sir, the importance of, of the relationship with Mexico as one of the drivers within the NAFTA. I think just the number of players that have come into transformation over the last few years, the numbers are uh, gigantic. Those gigantic numbers of exports, which I can, of course, improvise also, but they, the, those, <laughs> those, those numbers are just uh, massive, and they all have a name behind them. They all have an association, and they all have an effort and an initiative that is being successful. So I, I, I think that, yes, it's in place, and uh, it's very exciting. Yeah. I'm really sorry one to be final the, question. I don't think we have time for a final <laughs> question, Peter. We, don't have, time for final we question. don't have time for a final question, but we would like to thank our panelists for this fruitful discussion because there's certainly a lot of questions coming from the audience. And also, thank you to all the audience members who are keeping the dialogue going with your thought provoking questions. I'm told that we are taking a break and that everybody needs to be back in here at uh, 10.55 to get ready to go to, go to the second section. So since I'm, Precisely. Since I'm the moderator, I'm going to end up with, <laughs> with one comment about collaboration, et cetera, about political will. <laughs> no, seriously, the number of participants needs to expand and include not only the private sector, but workers and campesinos and others. It needs to be an up from the bottom process as well as the top-down process. I'm done. Thank <laughs> you so much. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. <laughs>
Paz Castillo is a Tijuana native who studied voice training in Mexico, the United States, and Russia. After initial interest in ranchera music, he trained in opera, performing with Secut's Opera Ambulante, the Tijuana Opera, and serving as a core member of the San Diego Opera Chorus. And we're going to begin this, this, after, this morning rather with Manuel. Libia, Bolivia, Monelieti, Colici, Piove, Nessa, Fiora, E la fuggevo, fuggevo, la nascina mia voluta. Libia, ne molti fremiti, che suscito l'amore, poiché quello che ho il cuore ogni potente va a trovare chi più quali ma ci avrà
seven months after the famous showing in Paris. Gabriel Vaire was the cameraman and producer that showed the first moving images projected on a screen for 50 cents at El Salon Rojo, and people watched in awe the arrival of the train, the card players, baby Lumiere having his breakfast, and very soon, this invention caught the public's attention, and in no time, audiences were able to see, to watch Don Porfirio's little promenade in Chapultepec Park, dancers attacking with gusto the Mexican hat dance and Rodolfo Gaona in the bull ring. The 1910 revolution gave way to the great years of the documentary tradition. In those years, when the world was storm-driven and needs were so urgent that shot everything else from view, Salvador Toscano, the Alba brothers, and many others captured the fury and the passion, the somber passion of the day. In the 20s, after the hard years of the revolution, everything had to be reinvented. The weapons at hand were schools, libraries, murals in public buildings, education and agriculture that led the changes that swept the country. Movies, I'm afraid, were left on the side. Vasconcelos didn't trust them. Es un asunto de gringos, he used to say. 
Now, the thirties saw Einstein's regrettably unfinished film, Que Viva Mexico, and later on the emergence of two popular genres. On the one hand, the Mexican melodrama. And the screens were filled with... <laughs> And the screens were filled with severe and rigorous fathers, crying mothers, and ungrateful sons and daughters. The Mexican rancheras came after, that praised the virtues of the ranch in countless films populated by singing charros and mariachi bands. By the same token, Mexico City became the inspiration for another popular genre, urban melodrama. The smoked field dancing club, where the tart with a heart of gold makes countless sacrifices to send her little sister to a nun's school so she can become a decent young girl. This is the world where Pedro Vargas, Toña la Negra, and Los Panchos sing the misfortunes of Ninon Sevilla, the fallen woman. Now, in the 40s, cinema was at the distribution companies paved the way for Mexicans, Me Mexico's dominance in the Latin American market. That took place in the 50s and lasted into the 60s. Now, the 70s were quite dark in the whole of Latin America, from porno chanchadas in Brazil to the infamous Fichera films in Mexico, movies of abysmal quality that made one shiver in horror. That sad landscape changed in the 90s when young filmmakers with great talent and imagination made pictures with a different point of view that addressed wider issues. In fact, Lubezki, Cuaron, Guillermo del Toro, Navarro, and Rodrigo Prieto are a good example of that generation. The 90s was also the decade of, national, of denationalization when the government pulled out of the Mexican film industry after 40 years of full-scale support. That was bad news. Now, maybe it's natural that countries that share borders develop a defensive view of each other. It happened throughout history. In fact, the Greeks called everyone else barbarian. The Romans had a condescending attitude towards everyone in imperial times. And England and France were fierce rivals for two centuries. Besides all the painful issues in our common past, the movies that Mexico and the United States have made of each other have a very difficult relationship, tattered to say the least. Cinema shows what societies think of the world and what the societies think of themselves. Films like La Rosa Blanca, Como Agua para Chocolate, El Jardín del Edén, The Treasure of Sierra Madre, His Majesty the American, and Traffic, to mention some, look an Ameri to Americans and Mexicans under a very unfavorable light, with distrust and prejudice. Even when guided with the best of intentions, film like Viva Zapata and The Fugitive or El Jardín del Edén are full of stereotypes that are very much in place. The bloodthirsty bandido, the robber baron, the dumb blonde, the beautiful senorita continue to appear once and again in the narratives. Regrettable for two countries that in the future will share a common sense of destiny. NAFTA. I mentioned before that the 19th brought with them the time of denationalization. 
So the film community, the community was quite disgruntled when the aid of the government was taken away. Here are some of the new rules of the game when NAFTA was negotiated. A new cinematographic law was passed in, by Congress in 1993 in preparation to NAFTA. That law wrote off the 50% screen time for Mexican films. Now they had to compete on equal terms with Hollywood. On the other hand, uh, Mex films were allowed to be dubbed. Every foreign material was allowed to be dubbed. And the, Na the Motion Picture Association of America expressed repeatedly a strong interest in having the film industry in NAFTA, given the fact that Canada had decided to exempt the so-called cultural industries from the treaty. We cannot have our two main partners exempting film from the treaty, said to me the motion after 1994, were very dark for Mexican cinema. What happened is that without the financial aid provided by the government, the market focused towards inexpensive commercial films and film production dropped down to the lowest number in history. Domestic distribution disappeared and exhibitors opted for American films. European, Latin American and Asian pictures virtually disappeared from movie theaters. The situation deteriorated to the point the government considered closing down Churubusco Studios and closing down also the Mexican Film Institute. Now, fortunately, 10 years ago, uh, the government decided to come back slowly. Uh, nowadays, it gives incentives, tax breaks, for about 600 million pesos a year. So that means that about 110 films are produced every year. But then they have to queue patiently for a limited release after the Hollywood blockbusters. This means that Spider-Man and the Avengers rule supreme. Now, against the lords, ladies and gentlemen, once more, Mexican cinema survived by the skin of our teeth. With great recognition in international film festivals, Good box, box office returns. Are we going through a boom? Is this going to last? Too soon to tell. In the end, the answer lies in the films themselves, the only trustworthy testimony of Mexican culture. Thank you very much. You can continue. If you'd like to come to the podium, you yes. can, or you can stay there. <coughs> Thank you. Seems natural. Since we didn't seem, we have to come here, no? <laughs> exactly. Well, it is a pleasure. I thank you very much for being here. I thank you, CSD, and all the, the staff that went through this delicate organization for the opportunity to be here to listen to this analysis of what has been going on in Mexico after NAFTA and to be able to think and share our thoughts from our own experience or our field of experience. Um, President uh, Napolitano referred to Octavio Paz's accent on dialogue as um, uh, understanding the other. I think literature 
is one of the finest instruments to look to the other, to understand otherness. Um, I was listening and looking at all the graphs and seeing what's going on on the uh, cattle, the market, the, the, the assembly of cars, the China, the s and um, I thought that all this that is hard uh, information wouldn't have a meaning if there was not a literary counterpart. That is, what has happened with our lives in those 20 years? How, how, how our dreams, accompli accomplishments, or failures have happened? And that's where liter literature uh, shines, because it's the memoir of our lives. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through through what has been going on from the writer experience in the last 20 years, briefly, of course. Um, I think literature has the power uh, to of memory to retain time, because who would doubt, for example, that Carlos Fuentes, uh, who would doubt that Californian writer, Nobel Prize, John Steinbeck, talks about agriculture in the 30s through East of Eden, and Grapes of Wrath better than perhaps many studies, at least much more from the emotional part of, or from the human condition, which is what literature is about after all. Literature cannot, one couldn't write uh, graphics or statistics. Maybe you could, you could uh, talk about how many more readers there are, how the uh, industry, publishing industry, has behaved, how many more writers exist in the country. But writing is about uncertainty. That's why I chose this title, Writing as a Hanging Bridge. The act of writing is like standing in a hanging bridge. The stake of falling is always there. There is no guarantee you will get to the other side. Not to mention if you will do it safely, you won't. If you were looking for safety, writing would not be your way of life. I refer to the hanging bridge not only as the sense of uncertainty that accompanies the accomplishment of a novel, short story, or other literary piece, but also because for the circle to be closed, others must be involved. The editor, the publisher. In Mexico, we just have one word for, for both figures, the editor, the bookseller, and of course, the reader. The hanging bridge is made by the complicity of all those involved, being the writer at one rim, the other rim the reader, luckily meeting at the center with an illusion provided by words, thus the bridge. The book itself being the passage, the object, being virtual or, or printed. So writing, or rather connecting with the reader, even if Faulkner said it only required paper and pencil, involves a process, a social process. Let us see by the, this premise what has been going on in, in Mexico in the past 20 years. I think the biggest change is the, um, the Fonca uh, appearing in the cultural scene. Fonca is the f national fund for, creating, for art creation. And by this means, this support, uh, this stimuli, it's not called a grant, it's called a stimuli. Many artists in different fields have benefited from the existence of this funding. And we're talking about uncertainty, and uncertainty means, uh, are you going to finish the book? Are you going to fill the objectives you want? How long will it take? How much research you have to do? Will somebody publish it? Will somebody read it? Will it make a change? Um, this. Uh, area of risk, uh, experimentation, uh, has to do, uh, again, with uncertainty and with a tradition uh, important in Mexico. The state, as a promoter of the arts, uh, with, this, um, with this important uh, promo uh, support, writers and other artists can devote to their field of interest. The Sistema Nacional de Creadores, it's given after 35 years of age, you have to have some, um, have shown you have a, a trayectoria, I forgot the word, <laughs> and um, you're given it for three years where you have to inform of what you've been doing 
and um, you get um, money that might um, change the balance in order not to do the multitask or freelance jobs that uh, will take you away from your writing. You cannot survive from that only, but it makes a great difference. It has made and so this has really changed the writing scenario in Mexico. I was a part of the um, selecting committee of the Sistema Nacional de Creadores last year, and you could see it was very hard. Everybody wants to get in there. Everybody uh, needs Fonca, and uh, of course there's a lot of talent, and from 270 that apply, just 20 could be chosen. So that's hard poets, essayists, novelists, and, and of course some, some won't like you anymore probably, uh, and you'll be on the other side like I've been on other times. But what I could see or what we discussed between the ones that were there is how the younger ones that have had this privilege when I was their age, there was no school of writers, there was not Fonca, there was just the Centro Mexicano de Escritores, uh, which was very important at its time. Rulfo and Arreola were the ones that uh, conducted and tutorized the writers. Uh, you can see that the youngest writers have done a lot of experimenting, of devoting their time to writing, so they have prizes, they have been published internationally and nationally, especially by independent publishing houses, which is part of what's been going on too. Um, the publishing... Um, situation we have big publish we have fondo de cultura económica which is 60 per 60% of the publishing is done there it's state uh, owned and the other are the uh, independent big commercial houses merging industries that uh, cannot bet on literature for their strongest part literature 5000 um, units is a good in Mexico, that's considered good for literature. So what's blooming now, it's the independent houses. Uh, they also can get st uh, funds from the state, and they're, they don't have the pressure to sell. They can sell a small amount of books, and that keeps their balance. So we're seeing like Sexto Piso, Bonobos, um, Fosforo, just to drop a few names, or to see how Almadia, a Oaxacan-located uh, uh, publishing house, it was a family business uh, that provided for all the school supplies in Oaxaca, and Almadia has, it seems like it has united to the contemporary Oaxacan uh, strong uh, art and cultural movement, because it publishes beautiful books, authors, uh, you, you can bet that they have strong authors, they also translate and publish, and they have beautiful imaginative book uh, designing. So they're doing, they're doing fine. Uh, the themes that um, we can notice in the past or the recent years are deal with either the novela historica or new historic novel, the revision of our past seems to be a constant preoccupation. It was since Noticias del Imperio 30 years ago, and the new novela histórica uh, revises our history, but desacralizing, de demythifying the bronze figures of our history, in a way rewriting ourselves as we write historica, novela histórica. Also, you can see a flourishing of that. Na wha what's been called la the narco novela uh, that deals with the narco themes or the violence or the female abuse. Uh, this has even found a language for it, like what Elmer Mendoza, Humberto Cross, White uses. Or, uh, and this is a situation that, does, uh, that deals with the north of Mexico, the border being very present, as you, well very kn you know very well, the Secut in Tijuana, uh, also, uh, we've enjoyed the opera singers from Secut, but uh, there has been a very strong um, identity movement in Tijuana that has um, made, um, we say, like what Cristina Rivera Garza, a professor uh, here at UCSD, a very no well-known writer is doing. She's using um, all kinds of documents, ways of looking at things, uh, even the Twitter has uh, been made part what I think of the social networks, Twitter is what has really changed or made a click
for writers when it's used for art, it's because of its aphoristic possibility. And the other theme that's, uh, that's happening now, and it, this is a question for myself and for everybody, is uh, writers are dealing with personal memoir. Personal, it's like a reflection is needed, and we can see it through the latest published novels that have been awarded, like Julian Herbert's Canción de Tumba, that won the Elena Poniatowska recently. Um, it, this is a new prize, that uh, new award that um, the Mexico City cultural area of the government gives uh, founded, and he got this prize. Also, uh, Miriam Moscona writing. Uh, about her Sephardi background and her personal memory uh, has won the Villaurrutia Prize. And last week or last two weeks, Rafael Perez Gay won the Mazatlan Literary Prize for El Cerebro de Mi Hermano that deals with sickness and the relationship with his brother, Jose Maria Espinaza, that recently died. So I think personal memory is part of the themes that are being, the, the way um, we're looking, or the way um, personal life meets literature in some of the actual writers in Mexico. I myself, I'm, I'm tempted, and I'm going into that field too. And um, just to finish, I think our, our most notable voices, our conscience, our, uh, the, the eyes, because I believe literature has an optical dimension. That means I it is good to see what's far away, to magnify what's very small, and of course it has a mirror, it's a reflection uh, um, quality in it. And, uh, our most important voices, we have lost them uh, in the past few years and in the last few months. Carlos Fuentes died recently, Carlos Monsiváis, José Emilio Pacheco, Federico Campbell. Uh, they were the voice of a time, a conscious conscience. Uh, they were lights that made us look at ourselves and around ourselves at Mexico and at the others. So with this literary orphanage, I think we are witnessing or we're about to witness what will come out of this. Who are the new voices or there won't be uh, such a few. Th diversity is what um, characterizes what is being written right now and I guess the voices that will, uh, we will identify with are about to emerge or to, to happen. Thank you very much. Gracias, Monica. And Luis Felipe, would you like to come up here? Thank you. Oh, I think it's me. Muy bien. Yes. Um, eh, gracias por la invitación. Gracias, Melissa. Como del, del proceso de, de producción y de trabajo de las de las obras visuales. Eh, casi como desde este proceso de trabajo de unos 20 años, 25 años. Tu esta lectura la calle el estudio, los otros, uno mismo y algo sobre el presente. Intentaré hablar y pensar en los próximos minutos en términos de posibilidad. Por muchas razones, posibilidad es un término o un concepto que abriga algo más que un posible. Es un término duro en tanto que apunta hacia adelante, tiene que venir de algún lugar. Es decir, obliga a hablar en términos históricos, obliga y permite hacer genealogías. ¿Qué es lo que hace que uno sea, qué es lo que hace que algo sea posible o no? ¿En qué permite que algo sea 
no sea posible que, te, que se transforme en imposibilidad? Estamos aquí y podríamos pensar que algo es posible, que algo parecido al acto de la reflexión, al acto mismo del pensamiento, comenzaría a vislumbrarse en algún momento, en algún gesto, en alguna palabra, quizá en algún sonido. Entonces, una especie de silencio parecería necesario, una mayor atención a los gestos del otro, de los otros. Sería lo mínimo que necesitaríamos para poder aprenderlo y ver en ese gesto, en ese sonido, en esa palabra, una acción posible. Un acto que transforme este aquí y este ahora en este momento. Como si una transformación inaudita nos hiciera pensar, pasar a otro ahora, a una hora diferente, diferenciado. Haciendo un corte ahí donde todo parecía donde parecía que todo era una especie de tiempo continuo. Si algo así puede suceder, quiere decir entonces que hemos cambiado de posición, quiere decir que hay un cambio de lugar, que aquí seguimos y sin embargo ya estaríamos en otro tiempo. Pertenezco a una generación, la que cruzó de los años 80 a los 90 en México, una generación que parecía vivir y estar en un momento complicado, en un momento que eran muchos momentos. Políticamente parecía que habíamos dejado atrás el barco, un barco con el casco roto, una serie de hendiduras, pero aún flotando. Si es verdad que toda generación vive un momento trágico y tiene un momento de esplendor, la mía había pasado ya por el primer momento, por el derrotero de la tristeza que sigue a todo momento de desesperanza. Las elecciones de 1988 habían sido de alguna manera eso, un punto de anclaje gris, un inicio tan sórdido como inaudito. Ahí donde nada es eso que vemos, entonces hay que aprender a mirar de otro modo el presente, hay que buscar otra manera de estar con los otros. ¿Comenzamos con el acto heroico? No. La respuesta inmediata es no. Para aquellos jóvenes que comenzábamos a correr el riesgo de ser artistas, parecía que no era tan inmediato el cobijo del, del existencialismo, ni siquiera el del nihilismo, y mucho menos el del anarquismo. Estábamos parados frente a un momento que implicaba un corte, una transición mucho más duro, dura de lo que nuestro espíritu radical podía entrever. El corte se estaba produciendo ya y sus consecuencias serían inevitables. Visto a la distancia, podría plantearse la pregunta sobre cuáles fueron, específicamente en el arte, las condiciones que hicieron posible su metamorfosis, que obligó a que la escuela heredada por la pintura y la escultura fuera abandonada para ir hacia otro lado. Concretamente, ¿hacia dónde y qué o quién podía señalar esa ruta. La pregunta era necesaria si queríamos transformar los modos en que uno puede entenderse a partir de una práctica. No solamente porque soy lo que hago, sino porque la pregunta sobre el hacer hay que ponerla en un marco mucho más amplio, en el marco de la necesidad, en el marco de lo que necesito de esa práctica y qué implica responder a esa necesidad. Ante un momento, un aquí y ahora, que había apagado las voces, que había, dejado, que había dejado en un largo, muy largo balbuceo a la voz que en otros momentos era capaz de lanzar un rugido encolerizado, ante una especie de silencio que comenzaba a reinar en muchos ámbitos creativos, la pregunta sobre uno mismo, la pregunta que invierte y que va, a, y que va filtrando el es cómo podemos recurrir a la cosa, a determinado tipo de lenguaje, a determinado tipo de recursos visuales para provocar vínculos que nos puedan posicionar en relación al otro. No se trata ya de ir a la búsqueda de una sensibilidad que nos había marcado y que nos daba cierta identidad, sino de recurrir a una transformación de herramientas que son capaces de desestabilizar 
eso que creíamos que podíamos ser desde nuestra práctica. Parado sobre este corte, sobre ese límite y ese tiempo, que son muchos tiempos, esos primeros años de los 90 fueron un intenso laboratorio para sondear los límites de una posible transformación. El trabajo sobre la historia, la posibilidad de trabajar con la historia y reformularla desde una serie de actores que no habían aparecido ahí, incluir posiciones precisas para generar lenguajes y acceder a ciertas maneras en la producción del saber, se trataba de aprender, de dejar ver los procesos, abrir el espacio a ciertas formas de lo indeterminado, hacia una creencia de que algo podía pasar. Desde muchos espacios, las la, la, y en otros lugares ha sido posibles. ¿Por qué no reactivarlas? ¿Por qué no incorporarlas? ¿Por qué no hacer de este tiempo otros tiempos? ¿Por qué no dejarnos ver de la diferencia? Un espacio que no ha sido marcado como espacio de la visibilidad, sino del sujeto que quiere pensarse, dejarse ver como aquel que se piensa. En 1994 era muy claro trabajar de otro modo, el producir de, otra, eh, de otro modo, el poder producirse de manera diferente y hacer la diferencia. Desde otro verse. Allá, allá en las montañas parecía volverse a escuchar un rugido. Y ese grito recorrió el país por muchos años. La posibilidad también de perderse en esa transformación. Razones específicas y concretas para creer que dicha transformación y posicionamiento de los procesos creativos en los sectores sociales de los años 90 hablaron una manera de escapar las formas de control que unifican el pensamiento y que de cierta manera lo aniquilan. Apuntar contra el control de ciertos procesos creativos, entendido como proceso de resistencia, permite releer la historia de ese momento en México como algo más que un puro reacomodo de los sistemas de globalización. Obliga a ver las especificidades en la instauración de ciertas maneras de hacer que se volvieron nuestras. Los años 90 son, en buena medida, el momento en que los artistas procuramos construir sistemas de diálogo y procesos de conocimiento que implicaban un proceso de pensamiento crítico. Si comienza, si comienza a reconocerse que algo estaba pasando ahí, va más allá de la mera especulación en cuanto al reconocimiento de una manera de proceder en relación a la cosa, llámese obra de arte. Es la pregunta misma sobre cómo se comporta de dónde y cuándo, algo que es un procedimiento específico para salir de los sistemas de control. Los mecanismos que las sociedades disciplinarias imponen como mecanismos para estar dentro del sistema. Los artistas, es cierto, importamos un tipo de información que no estaba incluido en las maneras de entender el arte. Hicimos un proceso para alimentarnos de aquello que no está en el menú de los sistemas formativos, escuelas, talleres, espacios de difusión. Salimos a alimentarnos en zonas fuera del control del Estado, incluso cuando el Estado nos estaba patrocinando. Quizá eso todavía falta por leerse y discutirse. Desde el ámbito de las artes visuales, desde el ámbito de las artes visuales, México llegó a nuevos milenios desde la producción y el pensamiento crítico. Arribó con obras que, leído en su complejidad, levantaron el andamiaje tiempo. Si hoy México ocupa un lugar importante dentro del arte contemporáneo, es porque aprendió de ese proceso crítico de pensamiento. Esa crítica se eclipsó por un tiempo y hoy vuelve a ganar terreno. Esta es la mejor aportación del arte de los últimos 20 años. Hablar de términos de posibilidad. Y toda posibilidad debe implícita. So we're going to continue now with the panel discussion, and then if there's time, we'll go to a few questions. Well, thank you very much.
This was uh, wonderful. Uh, when Monica was uh, speaking, suddenly uh, a, a very powerful phrase that I read as a teenager and was existentially powerful for me was a phrase by an Italian aphorist, Antonio Porcia, who wrote this very short sentence, we live with the hope of becoming a memory. And I think that's importance of uh, what we'll be hearing this, this morning. Artists are in many ways the keepers of memories. And in doing so, they're also uh, the ones that allow us to think about the future, to reimagine our society and the way we, we live and the things we do. Because without memories, we cannot actually uh, elaborate into the future. And uh, I would like to throw a challenge here, and I would like to hear uh, the panelists' reaction to that. I believe that with respect to art, especially in the last 20 years, in Mexico, we have been developing a sort of national schizophrenia, in the strict sense of the word, of uh, divided thinking. And let me start with something that uh, I drew my attention when it came out some years ago. During the presidency of Calderon, he made himself, as a matter of fact, he, he, he was the protagonist of uh, 12 short films uh, of a series that was called Mexico the Royal Tour. I don't know if you saw it. Yes, uh, in which he was trying to show the world how wonderful Mexico was and attract people to visit Mexico and to, and to consider Mexico as a destination. And it drew my attention that it didn't mention come to the wet t-shirt shirt concert, uh, contest in Los Cabos or come to the El Shrimp Bucket in Mazatlan. Mm -hmm. It was basically showing nature and art and culture. Uh, and, or I, I should put it the other way around, first culture and then nature. And in some parts he made the, the, the persons that did the documentaries a great um, task of joining nature and culture by showing, for example, the human-made landscapes of Jalisco around the cultivation of tequila as one of the wonders, wonders of, of Mexico. And I mention this because at the same time those videos were made, most of the destinations that the president was showing as the main reason to, for foreigners to come to Mexico were being put under threat by agencies of the Mexican federal government who wanted to make developments in them and who wanted to at least partially destroy them to make business. And I think this really shows uh, the, the big challenges that um, culture faces in Mexico. Uh, perhaps very well uh, depicted by the logo of this, of this meeting. When we talk about Mexico, we're not showing their uh, car factories, we're not showing their uh, animal feedlots, we're showing culture, basically. We talk about Mexico, we talk about culture, but at the same time, very often, culture in Mexico survives in heroic ways without much governmental support. So the one reason that makes uh, Mexicans in general, I would say Mexican authorities, to be proudest of the country, which is Mexican culture, and the way Mexicans perceive the environment and the way people in Mexico understand their own, their own surroundings, is really one of the things that, that, that receives less support. And this is uh, my, well, I would like to add a couple of other things. Um, and yet, if you think about it, Culture is an immense driver in Mexico of the economy. For example, there's nothing that has helped the city of Guadalajara grow so much as International Book Fair. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no regional driver that has been so successful in driving a regional economy as Ensenada, here 100 miles, less than 80 miles south of the border, that basically is a city of science and arts. It, it is not a city with big industries, it's, and around it, a hundred other things have, have grown. We've seen it over and over again, and I don't want to, to elaborate uh, overly on, on the subject, how culture and as little investment on culture can really transform many parts of Mexico and bring regional development and change the way people operate and live in, in the country. But that does, is not always taken into consideration. And let me, a uh, wonderful, wonderful effort, really, UC Mexus. Uh, we operate with money from the California legislature, 
and good for them. I really, I'm really thankful for that. And also with money from CONACYT, the Mexican federal government. And in the last five years, as I've been here, I've been trying over and over again to establish sim something similar for culture and arts, because we only basically support, or we mostly basically support science. And you don't know how difficult it is in both countries to convince decision makers that culture and arts as, are as important as engineering or molecular biology. And that without culture and arts, we really do not have a common future. And that's my position. Of course, I'm saying this. I'm not an, an artist. I'm, I'm, I'm a scientist. Uh, but this is, this is the tenet, the challenge I would like to, to give you. Uh, what can we do to make culture and arts more present uh, in, in, our, in our governments, in our countries, and to convince our decision makers that really without them, there is no future? Well, um, very little, I'm afraid, <laughs> because what you just said, Ezekiel, uh, when, the, when NAFTA was being considered and negotiated, uh, as I mentioned before, the Canadians uh, exempted the cultural industries. They wanted to, inverted commas, protect uh, Canada's identity. And they considered that uh, the U.S. was going to overwhelm Canada. So they, they didn't agree to include the, the, industry, the cultural industries in, in NAFTA. Uh, our reaction was, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because we have a very strong culture. So we are, are not afraid of actually throwing in cultural industries into NAFTA because nothing will happen. In the end, uh, Mexican culture will prevail. Now, that is, that is not true, of course. You know, that, that is a fallacy. Uh, culture, and in fact, nowadays, needs support and it needs to be to be encouraged. Monica uh, talked about the importance of literature, how literature really cap captures and tells about, about the way we are. Right? And you were saying about this lost voices, Fuentes and Monsiváis and José Emilio, etc. Now, those voices, I'm sure, will be replaced by others that will talk and discuss the, what Mexico finds interesting. Now, culture is one of the best assets Mexico has. Government doesn't really appreciate, and I'm afraid, dear Ezequiel, that it will not appreciate it in the future because they consider it done. It's a given. Doesn't need to be encouraged. I think it's through education mainly. Universities like here. The, for example, I was talking with some publishers uh, in Mexico and they were telling me what happened when they uh, NAFTA um, encouraged the possibility of having books in Spanish sold in the States. And I th they thought they had had high expectations for this. And what they saw is that, of course, literature was not what was selling in Spanish. Uh, that the readers, the younger generations that had been born from Spanish-speaking parents read in English. Um, and so at the universities, the universities are the largest buyers of books from Mexican authors. They study Mexican authors. So since I still believe that art and culture is a way to see uh, what's happening, I think um, at the universities in our country, in the States, uh, the pride for what we culturally are, the way to teach it since you're in elementary school, it's a way that maybe decision makers in a few years could uh, banks um, and FONCA 
And there were a lot of projects that had to do with Mexico, US, very imaginative in all the fields, and that has disappeared. No? Mm -hmm. I was thinking of your Mexus uh, proposal, well, the idea of culture and arts being part of the of the agenda for both countries. No, I, I think NAFTA should be the framework for these uh, projects, uh, possibility of them happening to rise again. But I think education is our main our main weapon. Luis Felipe, yo yo pienso que en el fondo tiene que ver con los sistemas de regulación, de regulación interna, de regulación local, de regulación global. Y creo que en los últimos 20 años estos sistemas de regulación han tomado pues, caminos muy particulares y muy, y muy perversos, porque tanto a nivel nacional, los, eh, cómo se regula el, el, los, los apoyos y los presupuestos dentro de México, Creo que tiene que ver con estas lecturas de cultura, arte, cómo, cómo se filtra, dónde realmente está procediendo, qué está generando culturalmente y a partir de qué tipo de, de entendimiento de la cultura. Yo creo que yo regresaría un poco a, a plantear un poquito esta, esta idea, porque si no, no nos posicionamos respecto a, a un tipo de producción específica que tiene mecanismos de distribución específica. Y eso es lo que pasó, creo, en los últimos 20 años que por lo menos en el caso de las, de las artes visuales en México, tiene una especie de boom y que tiene y entra al mercado internacional y empieza a girar en torno a los grandes eh, mecanismos de, de, de producción de dineros y que hay una gran fiesta, eso tiene que ver con ciertos mecanismos de regulación. Y la pregunta es, ¿qué pasó dentro del arte mexicano? La literatura, el cine también, pero creo que en particular la... la la producción artística, creo que eh, tiene que ver con estos mecanismos de regulación que estamos viviendo. Y esos mecanismos pasan por las instituciones públicas, universidades, Foncas, Fulbrights, etcétera, pero pasan también por, por, por un otro tipo de regulación mucho más perversa que tiene que ver con el cómo, quién, dónde se pone a circular. Y aquí el quién empieza a problematizar muchísimo más el asunto porque en el quién y cómo se produce en México y el quién y cómo se distribuye, etcétera, pues deja ver capas súper complejas de estas identidades. ¿no? Um, we have seven minutes, exactly. Uh, I would like, uh, if our master of ceremonies agrees with this, uh, open the floor to, to questions. Uh, I might have a final comment also to make, but uh, I would love to open the floor to questions if there are any questions. Back there. There's someone back there. Can uh, somebody get the microphone? Muchísimas gracias por sus presentaciones desde un principio hasta este momento han sido fabulosas. Me llamo Sandra Pedregal y soy maestra de, de español, precisamente de castellano, aquí en la Escuela de Relaciones Internacionales. Así es que a nombre de mis colegas, muchísimas gracias. Pero también me gusta a veces crear una poquita de controversia. Entonces, bien, bien. la pregunta que yo les tengo tiene que ver con algunas de las cosas que han estado ustedes a, hablando y me parece que están hablando por lo general de cultura institucionalizada, de cultura que viene de la jerarquía hacia abajo. Y realmente la cultura no es algo fijo, es algo que a través del tiempo evoluciona, que a través del tiempo crece y que la cultura es lo que el pueblo crea. O sea, no estamos hablando de, de… a mí me encanta Carlos Fuentes, me encanta Monsiváis, los conocí a los dos, fabulosos escritores, etcétera, pero la cultura es lo que el pueblo produce, la cultura es lo que, lo que el pueblo desarrolla de acuerdo al contexto histórico, económico y político del cual está siendo este, creado. Entonces el hablar solamente de esta cultura que viene de las universidades, de las instituciones gubernamentales, que son hasta cierto punto este, como embudos que escogen qué es lo que se va a propagar, me, me parece un poquito, un poquito vacío, en el sentido de que no estamos hablando de cómo realmente en los últimos 10 años el desarrollo del internet, 
de, la, de los medios de comunicación que están a la mano de los artistas jóvenes, está creando eh, escritores, eh, pintores, escultores de gran talento y que realmente quizás nunca lleguen a ser famosos internacionalmente o inclusive nacionalmente en México por el hecho de que las instituciones no los reconocen. ¿Qué opinan ustedes sobre eso? Bueno, yo creo que hay instituciones y hay mercado. Aquí el problema de que no exista, por ejemplo, el contrapeso de las instituciones es que si la escritura se atuviera nada más, digamos, o la producción de diferentes artistas de todo tipo, ¿no? Eh, por las leyes del mercado… Ah, I don't know if I should talk in English or Spanish. I'm sorry. ¿En qué? Como quieras. En español es más fácil. Si se atuviera las leyes del mercado, no se publicaría todo lo que nos pudiera dar. Digamos, habría que es un mercado complaciente. Las editoriales no se arriesgarían por libros muy experimentales. Lo que tradicionalmente ha sido importante, que es la figura del editor, editor no el publisher, sino el editor, como un seleccionador, como un interlocutor y diálogo con el escritor y la figura incluso del librero que ya se está perdiendo, que es el que te orienta, o cómo nos vamos a orientar, pero las redes sociales son imparables y es un fenómeno muy interesante y hay blogs notables y hay mucho que hablar de ese tema que no daba tiempo en los 12 minutos. Yo usé este término de regulación y creo que pasa por por esto que estás preguntando, o sea, la, la regulación no solo es política, no solo es económica, sino que tiene que empezar a jugar con este tipo de capas, como eso me refería, como de, de capas sociales, de grupos, de identidades, de, de estas como multiplicidades que a la vez están jugando con otro tipo de, de, de identidades, de economías, de políticas, etcétera y que yo creo que están como reconfigurando estos, estos marcos. Si tú piensas, por ejemplo, en la relación arte y artesanía, y que Octavio Paz o muchos escritores lo, 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 lo estudiaron mucho, a partir, digamos, de esta como fortaleza, de esta, de esta producción que tiene México, objetual, de, musical, etcétera, etcétera, cómo se, otra vez, cómo a partir de los últimos 30 o 20 años, se ha venido transformando esta, esta regulación. Yo creo que tiene que ver con todos estos ámbitos. Uno es el, el, digamos, el que tiene, casi diría, un exceso de visibilidad, que son estos, estas, estos triunfos, digamos, ¿no? los Óscares del domingo pasado, y ese es un elemento entre muchísimos otros. Pero ahí también está un proceso de regulación específica. Do you have any other? Oh, yeah, there's, sorry, there's the strong light I don't see, but there's one hand here. Hmm. Hi, um, my name is Christian Limon. Uh, you were talking about finding ways to uh, promote the arts between the two countries. Um, maybe, I know there, I mean, there, there were funds and there are still funds, um, and I know the essence of the fund is to allow the artists to work Um, or focus on, it, on, on their work as opposed to having to find some sources of income. <coughs> Unfortunately, there are some artists that make it, make it a way of living, and they apply every year, and, and, and they just do it automatically. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to create a work of art. Um, I work for an, in, an art institution, the government, um, and, and so I, I became aware of a lot of the strategies. Um, wouldn't it be better, cheaper maybe, uh, to create or open up spaces for the artists, maybe expos uh, where the artists can bring their samples um, uh, and, and maybe network the, um, the, the, um, the book companies and the writers and also the, the, the paintings, uh, open up just forums for the artists to express themselves? Between the two countries. Uh, uh, between the two countries. Uh, okay. I will. I will probably uh, address the the film uh, side of, of the question. See, the, the the difficulty with film is that it's it's bloody expensive to make a film. Uh, more or less in Mexico City, 
every film you make costs about two million dollars, which is nothing for Hollywood, right? I mean, Avatar costed something like two hundred and something million dollars, right? But in Mexico, two million dollars is quite a lot. So, uh, I mean, film sits uh, apart from the rest of the cultural uh, manifestations of a country. Books, the visual arts, uh, dance, music are much more accessible, closer to the people, closer to this ferment of the people that produces art in the long run. Uh, film is a different uh, animal altogether, and it needs an industry, and it needs distribution channels, and uh, is close to Hollywood, and Hollywood has perfected this, uh, this science, let's call it science, I, I don't dare to call, to call it art, uh, to make lots and lots of money with films. And, and you have, I mean, very, very good films, and Steinbeck has been, uh, you know, translated, inverted commas, into film, and, and you have great expressions, but the, the common denominator of the movie is entertainment. You go to the movie theater to be entertained, to forget for two and a half hours or one and a half hours uh, your problems. Leave, you leave your problems outside and then you are captured by the screen, the characters, the drama. Uh, now, that uh, is a very, very uh, interesting proposal, but as I say, regrettably, it requires money. I think very briefly, in a country that has very few readers like Mexico, although paradoxically we have this, the second largest world fair in the, the book fair in the world in Guadalajara, uh, if NAFTA would have made that all the writers uh, could have their books in all the cities in the U.S. W where we know there's a lot more readers, uh, and maybe in Spanish and in English, maybe a different situation, uh, because we read much more uh, writers born in the States in Mexico than the other way around. There's a, 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 an unbalance there, also with Spain, no? Solo una, una cosa, creo que la, la, la idea de la producción de una cosa, una obra literaria, una obra cinematográfica, creo que en el caso particular de las obras visuales tenemos la, la gran fortuna de poder utilizar literalmente cosas. Eh, puse un par de imágenes, no me podía detener en ellas, pero creo que algo que fue muy significativo es que esta producción de estas cosas, que era producción de sentido y producción de trabajar con un lenguaje en específico, eh, hablaba también de una, eh, cómo se estaban haciendo vínculos entre artistas mexicanos, norteamericanos, referencias que no estaban incorporadas, pero sobre todo que lo que está poniendo en juego es esta permanencia de la cosa. Y eso creo que empezó a problematizar mucho la, la producción de la, de la obra. Está esta pieza de Eduardo Baroa del esta pieza que estaba en los mercados públicos de las calles de la Ciudad de México, que es una referencia a otro artista norteamericano y que por otro lado está hecha con materiales súper pobres, que pone la cosa con el otro. Lo demás, es, no sé qué es. Gracias, Luis Felipe. Um, I'm going to end with, with this, just a, a brief comment in relation to the last question. There is now a Feria Internacional del Libro International Book Fair in Spanish in Los Angeles, in L.A., every year, which is wonderful, by the way. And it's doing very, very well. It's, it's, it's a hopeful thing happening. They, they made it uh, bi-yearly. Yeah, so there's yeah, not going to be this year, but next. That's right, yeah. It's, it's biannual. Uh, yeah. But uh, I've, I've been there, and it's, it's really very, very uh, successful. I would like to end this completely off the program. I hope uh, Melissa doesn't hate me. With just one point of reflection to end it. As, as a natural scientist and not as, as an artist myself, I think that one of the most basic aspects of culture is food. 
<laughs> and this, of course, is a property because we're going to eat, eat tacos now. But think about this for a second. Uh, we are very proud, as a matter of fact, thanks to the wonderful work of Cristina Barros, Mexican cuisine is now part of, uh, has been recognized uh, as part of World Heritage um, in, in the Heritage Committee, and that makes us really proud. But having said that, with NAFTA, we got an amazing change in the Mexican diet. For those of you that come from Mexico City, you remember the Molino de Nixtamal? <laughs> it's gone. gone. It's gone. We're eating now industrialized food, and the consequences are terrifying. According to the Minister of Health, Mercedes Juan, with whom I've spoken this thing, there are kids that are nine years old and have already adult onset diabetes. Yes with a life expectation of no more than 35 years. This is the consequence of one of the, this is for me, the elephant in the room around uh, the consequences of free trade. We have had an amazing change in, in the way we eat. and We are only now starting to be aware of that. And of course that has a scientific component, but for me it has way more than that, a cultural component that we need to discuss and learn and uncover. But that will be a subject, hopefully, Melissa, for a next uh, Mexico Moving Forward meeting. Thank you very much. And let's go for lunch. How are you um, out to the patio to have your lunch and thank our sponsors, Sempra, Simsa, Sun Road Automotive, San Diego Unified Port District, the Institute for International Comparative and Area Studies, the Smart Border Coalition, the Border Legislative, Legislative Conference, and USAID. So lunch will be served in the patio. Please be back in place in the auditorium at 1.40 to continue with the afternoon program. Gracias. For a, a junk democracy, as, as the Mexican democracy, it got to a point that we confuse democracy with, uh, with gridlock. And uh, a few... Uh, years ago, President of Colombia, Juan Manuel Santos, said that a country that suffers extreme political polarization inevitably experiences economic stagnation. I'm sure that this, true, uh, this, this uh, phrase holds true both sides of, the bo of our borders. In the Mexican case, it was these 15 years of talking about the same issues, and suddenly, in high speed, we, we worried for years of the things that were not happening, and now we have to worry of the things that are happening and how they are happening. So it, it's very positive that we are looking at the country in a different light, in a different speed. So many reforms have occurring uh, in, in a short uh, period of time. But uh, we managed already to do what was the hardest thing to imagine, now we have to achieve the hardest thing to do. The hardest thing to imagine is that we will address issues as uh, confrontational as energy reform in Mexico, which is also very close to our heart, very close of our, to our national identity. And I'm sure, as, as my friend Duncan will, will address, it, it, it was uh, very complicated from so many perspectives of, of, of uh, national identity, historical perspective, the sort of failure of the previous process of reform during the Carlos Salinas uh, government, which promised to achieve the enormous economic growth and prosperity, and actually what we got at the end of, of the Salinas government was the te tequila crisis. So the Mexican population had this uncertainty about, about reform, and now we have to Re kind of rekindle the, the need to, to change, the need to, to reform. And that was uh, what happened in 2013. Which are the, the reasons that, that make me a bit uh, pessimistic about these complexities? We know very well in, in Latin America that it's easier to, to change the constitution than changing reality. A couple of weeks ago, I, I have a conversation with a Colombian entrepreneur. He, he, he's in the business of natural gas for vehicles. So he has around $2 million in stock, 
uh, circulating around Mexico City, which are taxis and buses, public transport buses, which were converted from diesel to natural gas. And he wanted to increase his investment in Mexico City, create different points of distribution could be, that could be very expensive because he has to uh, construct these pipes in order to connect all the distribution process. And he came to my office to kind of also in a ther therapeutic need to, to share his views that he was very optimistic that what Mexico has, uh, had achieved. But in this process to, to build a new distribution plant in Mexico City, he got uh, a permit to build the plant, a permit from the Mexico City government, which basically said that it was a provisional permit that could be remote, uh, revoked at any time. And he told me, imagine how I feel to go with my investors and tell them that I need $2 million to build a distribution plant of natural gas for vehicles in Mexico City with a permit that says that it's provisional and revocable. I didn't want to be in his shoes. And the problem, it really, uh, his personal problem as an entrepreneur, someone trying to bring money to invest in natural gas, which is good for environment and good for the economy because we don't have to spend so much public resources subsidizing uh, energy. Uh, he, it, it was that this re uh, reform at constitutional level gave him a lot of optimism of how Mexico would work. But suddenly, someone in, in the, uh, in, at, at the government in Mexico City decided not to give him the permit. So it's kind of a clash of visions and the, the clash of realities. Yeah, we managed to agree in a very challenging uh, constitutional debate to reform our laws that have been there for uh, most of the 20th century and all the, uh, the, the 21st century. And suddenly all this movement for change and reform, it's blocked by a bureaucrat that gives permits for energy distribution in Mexico City. So how are we going to balance these uh, efforts, this move for reforms with this and confront them with these basic realities on the ground? I would say that the biggest reform that Mexico needs is a reform that has not happened. The biggest structural reform is the rule of law. And I'm sure uh, my friend and colleague Edna Jaime will tell you more about it. But we basically, the, the fact that we Mexicans, starting by authority and government, will uphold and respect the law would be the biggest transformation in our economy, our politics, and our society. And that still hasn't happened. And what, how are we going to enforce and transform these huge uh, reforms that have had occurred at constitutional level into real prosperity, real opportunities uh, for, for the Mexican people in this con context of uncertainty where you could start a business, bring opportunity to Mexico City, reduce pollution, but you don't have the legal, legal certainty to guarantee that the business is going to be there in five or ten years and an uh, inspector from the delegation or the municipality will come and close your, your plant. These are the kind of practical challenges that we have to face day, to day, day in and day out. So the biggest challenge for reforms to work is to make them enforceable, to make the application of reforms in reality, to put them to work. And that's going to be an enormous challenge for the future years. And I hope they work, because what is at stake, I think it's much more larger than Mexican prosperity itself. It's also Mexican, the, the future of Mexican democracy. Because we pay a high price of social and political confrontation through the energy reform. And that price has to be transformed in goods for the people of real economic opportunities and economic growth. Because if not, I, I, would, I would have serious concerns of how this, if this doesn't deliver, this reform doesn't deliver the potential that it really has. I'm very optimistic about it, but I would leave the optimistic, the optimistic part to Duncan. If it doesn't deliver, I, would, I, I have my worries of how, for example, the presidential debates in 2018 will occur. 
criticizing this reform, that it was extremely conflicting at the heart of the Mexican society, at the heart of the Mexican politics, is, is this reform doesn't bring the potential for prosperity and growth for everyone. It's not just the economy which is, uh, would be in trouble. It's, it's the substance and the future of Mexican democracy itself. Anyhow, we should be very proud of what we have achieved. It's uh, it, the potential, it's enormous. We managed to transform a part of our economy that was uh, kind of designed by a Stalinistic model of, of economic development. The heart of our economy lied in the middle part of the 20th century and the rest of our economy, it's a globally integrated economy. There's, it's hard to find a country that has so many free trade agreements with the rest of the world as Mexico. But the energy sector, which was totally closed, still lived uh, in, a, in a time far from the present and far from the opportunity and potential that we all Mexicans deserve. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, great pleasure to be here. I, uh, I want to start with a little story. If you uh, are lucky enough ever to get invited to Pemex's boardroom and you get to walk in on the right hand side of the boardroom, you'll look up and you'll see a beautiful mural of the history of Mexico. If you look up on the left hand side, there's a mural of the history of the oil industry in Mexico. And it all begins with the early drilling for oil and discovery of a, a lot of oil in the ground and it gradually goes through the industrialization process of the oil, of the oil sector. And at the last panel of the mural, as you come to the right of the room, there's several figures in the, in the foreground representing Pemex. And in the background, there's a little fishing boat. And on that fishing boat, there's a man. If you look very closely, there's a man in the fishing boat. And that man is a guy called Rudecindo Cantarell. And Rudecindo Cantarell is a near mythical figure in Mexico now, because he's the man that completely by accident discovered one of the world's largest oil fields in the 1970s. Rudecindo gets on his fishing boat one day, goes out to the Bay of Campeche, uh, and he's fishing, and his, oil, his nets are covered in oil. So he comes back, and he goes to the local Pemex office, and he says, look, you've got an oil leak out there. You've got to fix it. And Pemex says, we don't have an oil well out there. And he says, well, you better go and have a look. And for a while, nobody really listens to him. But eventually, they go out, and they check it out, and they discover the world's, at the time, second largest oil field. Now, Cantarell became a mega field for Mexico and became a source of enormous wealth. And you'd like to think that Rudecindo received a percentage of the profits, but he didn't. He just got the oil field named after him. Hey, you know, that's, that kind of sucks, but what are you going to do? The reason why I mentioned Cantarell was because Cantarell became an albatross in many ways around the Mexican uh, government and Mexican economy's neck. Um, when asked in, uh, in, the, in the 1990s, um, what would have happened to Mexico if you hadn't discovered the Cantarell oil field? Um, an undersecretary of hydrocarbons in the energy ministry said, I think we probably would have been one of the most developed nations in the world by now. And the reason for that is because, as you can see on this chart on my left here, Cantarell at its peak, which was in 2003-2004, reached over 2 million barrels a day of production from one oil field. That's huge. And it bumped Mexican oil production up to three, almost 3.4 million barrels of oil a day. That was the peak. That was the high point. And from that point on, we saw a precipitous decline from 3.4 million barrels a day to 2.5 million barrels a day, which is where we are today, or 2.55, more or less. Mexico's government has suffered because of this decline in oil production in the country, partly because of the impact on Pemex, the national oil company, but also because, of course, the Mexican government has depended so heavily on oil revenue for its fiscal revenue, um, up to 35 or more percent of its total budget coming from that uh, particular element. And this is what made the energy reform so important, the energy reform that we saw last year in December. This is not a new story. This is a story that we have been telling since the mid-2000s. I actually got involved in Mexican oil policy discussions in 2005. And I said to everybody, when I looked at this chart about what was projected, I said, well, just show everybody the chart and they'll know what to do. But they said to me, we can't do that. And the reason why they can't do that is because we've done so many things before. The reason why the, the energy reform in December of last year was so extraordinary is because many impressive people had tried it before. Carlos Salinas had tried to have an energy reform. Vicente Fox had tried to have an energy reform. Felipe Calderón had tried to have an energy reform. And each time it was pushed back, for some of the reasons that uh, Juan already mentioned, the close connection between the Mexican people, 
sovereignty and oil. In one of the favorite things that I like to quote, there's a great uh, uh, opinion poll that's taken every couple of years by uh, CEDA University in Mexico City, where they ask Mexicans about their opinions about the world. And one of the questions on there is, um, if you believed it would uh, result in a significant improvement of your standard of living, would you agree to total integration with the United States of America? And year after year, a small majority of Mexicans say yes. Further down in the survey, there's another question. The Mexican oil industry is in trouble. We're losing production. Do you think that we should allow foreign direct investment in our oil sector? 80% of Mexicans say no. Now, if you put those two questions together, Mexicans are more likely to sell their country than their oil. Okay? That's why this is so important, because for years, people said to us that it can't happen, that people will never let it happen. Some of us said, we think that public opinion may be a little bit more malleable than that. The Pacto por Mexico that you've heard about already, um, was an extraordinary process last year. Not just an achievement in getting the parties together, but the ongoing negotiation that took place between them. And the pacto was really a prelude to the oil reform, because the oil reform, remember, the energy reform more broadly, didn't take place under the auspices of the, of the pacto. The pacto broke at that point, and you just had the pre and the pan against the PRD at that point in time. We had a government proposal in, in August of last year, which was actually quite a modest proposal. It talked about profit-sharing contracts, not even production-sharing contracts, profit-sharing, where a private company would be able to go in, produce the oil, pass it over to the state, the state would sell the oil and give a share of the profits back to the private company. And the private sector looked at it and said, we're really not that interested in this, you've got to do better. But the government only made a serious movement on making it better, more attractive for private investment, actually in the last days of the debate, when the PAN forced the government to accept a more ambitious proposal, essentially the proposal that the PAN had had on the table since before the government had proposed theirs. It's a very, very impressive political achievement when you actually look at the wording of the final legislation and you look at what the PAN put on the table earlier on in the year. We got an impressive reform. And I don't want to be a downer here because I actually think this is an incredible reform. But there's a lot of hard work to do now. And luckily, I think that this government recognizes the hard work that it has to do. Right now, we're having discussions about secondary legislation. And we kind of expected that secondary legislation would already be in the Congress by now. And we're all beginning to ask the question, where is it? Why do we not have this secondary legislation that is so important in implementing the constitutional reform that took place in December of last year? The answer to that question, I believe, is that the government is working incredibly hard with the opposition, not just the PAN this time, but also the PRD, on getting the secondary legislation right. Because it has to be right. It's impressive that you have a, 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 a big constitutional reform, but it's not enough. You need to have definitions. You need to have uh, delimitations. You have to have an assignment of responsibilities. And this secondary uh, legislation needs to go hand in hand with strong, firm, predictable regulations. You need to have regulatory institutions, which need to be built almost from scratch. Two of them exist already, of the three that need to be, need to be uh, in operation. But those two that exist already are weak institutions. They're understaffed, they're underfunded, and there's a lot of work to do. The government needs to work hard on the contract terms that will be offered to foreign investors because they've finally woken up to the fact that not everybody around the world wants to come in and get Mexican oil just because it's Mexican oil. The molecules that are in Mexican oil are exactly the same as the molecules that are in oil off the coast of Nigeria, off the coast of Brazil, in the Middle East, etc. Just because it's Mexican oil is not special. But for years, people in Mexico believed that First of all, the Americans, the evil British, of course, and others were de desperate to come in and steal Mexican oil. And now the realization is, look, there's a lot of oil in the world. If you don't offer the right terms, if you don't offer the right conditions, then the private sector isn't going to come in. And that's what the government's working hard on right now. They need to reform the national oil company. Well, in fact, they need to create a national oil company, because up until this point, Temex has just been a decentralized agency of the state. Now it has to become a company, a productive company. And it needs to start looking at making a profit, because that's going to be good for everyone. Just as Juan said, this needs to be a reform that works for the people of Mexico. It needs to be a reform which actually makes Pemex stronger, because otherwise people will see this as a failure. The role of the opposition is crucial in this, not just in the definition of constitutional reform, but now that these discussions are taking place, and I'm very encouraged by the fact that the PRD is now back at the table. And the PRD is coming in with actually very solid ideas with regards to regulation and to the reform of Pemex. 
In terms of a timeline, we're in the middle of this right now, 120 days from the passing of the constitutional reform for secondary legislation to be approved by the Congress. That has to be done by the middle of April, essentially. There's 90 days from the 20th of December for the government to actually, sorry, for Pemex to decide which oil fields it wants to hang on to, to submit that application to the National Hydrocarbons Commission, and the National Hydrocarbons Commission then decides on what Pemex gets to keep, what it gets to collaborate on with a private sector partner, and what it doesn't get at all. That process is going to take another six months after that. Pemex and the National Electricity Company, the CFE, have been turned into a productive public company by 2016. It's a lot of work to do in a very short period of time. And then we're going to look at round one of bidding. And we don't know when that's going to happen. The finance minister, Luis Villagaray, has told us that he wants to see it before Christmas of this year. I think that's uh, an extraordinarily ambitious goal. And I'll tell you why I think that's ambitious. Mostly because of the regulation and the institution building factors here. If you look at what needs to be done to repair Mexico for opening of its oil sector, there's an enormous amount of work to do. Just looking at the National Hydrocarbons Commission, at this point in time, it has a skeleton staff. It's going to need to hire, conservatively, 100 people. But more realistically, a couple of hundred people. And the sad thing is that those people don't exist. Because you don't have those people in Mexico. They don't exist in terms of having the training, the experience. Now, the answer from politicians is, oh, we'll just import them. Well, it's incredibly difficult to import those people. You have to convince them with salaries, conditions, and that Mexico is a place that they want to go and work and live. This is one of the biggest challenges. And if you speak to people in the regulatory uh, business right now, they're actually seriously concerned that the government's going to push through the first round of bidding, essentially opening up the private sector to the private sector without having the regulatory institutions in place. There are other challenges ahead for the Mexican energy sector. Public security is one issue that I'd be happy to talk over in the Q&A afterwards. I think that people tend to exaggerate it because the oil sector is used to working in difficult and dangerous conditions around the world. If they can work in Nigeria, they can probably work in Coahuila. But it is a cost. Infrastructure issues. There's a lot of infrastructure that needs to be built before this oil uh, reform can really actually take hold. The regulation issue I've already talked about, and human capital. I talked about human capital in the regulatory sector, but there's another serious problem. In Pemex alone, over the next five to seven years, we're going to see a mass extinction. Around 10,000 petroleum engineers are about to retire. Now, Pemex has these wonderfully generous terms where if you've worked a certain number of years, and if often that comes in your early 50s, you can retire on 120% of your final salary. Not bad, eh? I wish I had uh, done a petroleum engineering degree. What do those people do? Well, some of them go off and they live at the beach for the rest of their life. Some of them become consultants. You're going to lose an enormous number of people from Pemex, but you're also going to lose them from the oil sector in general. We've got to think about training petroleum engineers, seismic uh, mappers. We've got to think about training regulators, lawyers, managers to actually fully start this energy revolution, which is on the way. And to close, I just want to end on this. This is why it matters. Not just because you saw that precipitous decline, but what's left in Mexico. That first chart I showed you was about production. This is about what's left. If you look at it, the existing 3P, that's proven, possible, and probable reserves, standard measure in the oil industry, there's 43.8 billion barrels left in Mexico. If you add in unconventional, you have 32 billion barrels. If you add in, un uh, sorry, that's unconventional, that is, uh, is, 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 is uh, probable. If you have unconventional, which is prospective, this is oil that we think is going to be uh, oil and gas, which is going to be available in the shale reserves in Mexico. You add another 28 billion. And if you move on to the deep waters of the Gulf of Mexico, you have around 55 billion barrels of oil. Add it all together. Oil and gas potential in Mexico, 158, 159 billion barrels of oil equivalent. At $100 a barrel, that's a lot of money. And that's why the oil reform matters. Thank you very much.
Good afternoon. Thank, Thank you so much for everyone here at UCSD for the invitation to participate in Mexico Moving Forward Conference. This has been an incredible opportunity for me to learn from people coming both from Mexico and from the border region. Um, I'm stuck in Washington, D.C., where it's still snowing, and um, a, lot of the, a lot of my research is, um, is doing secondhand reading of what these luminaries write, and so it's really an opportunity, um, incredible for me to be here. I just wanted to say that my comments today, um, I work at a nonpartisan agency called CRS, Congressional Research Service, and we um, work for all the members and committees of Congress. So my comments today are my own, and they don't reflect um, the opinions of CRS um, or the opinions of Mexico on Capitol Hill, which, um, as you can imagine, they vary widely, whether you're talking to someone from the border who knows Mexico well, whether you're talking to someone who's not from the border region who knows nothing about Mexico, or whether you're talking to someone who's Republican or Democrat, it's very different. So today I'm just going to provide you with my impressions, um, not so much about the intricacies of the reforms going through um, in Mexico, um, because my expertise is more in the security realm, where um, it's been a less visible, less emphasized part of um, this government's uh, reform efforts. But I also, I just want to make some comments on how the reforms that they have done um, and that the Calderon administration began um, appear to be affecting our bilateral cooperation in both security and, and migration um, realms. For years, uh, U.S.-Mexican relations have, be, have been focused on trade, migration, or security. And we've really seen, in, in my time as an analyst, been focused on security since 9-11, and then during the Calderon administration when there was this all-out effort against criminal organizations. A lot of what I um, got questions about in the last five years or so has been about the violence in Mexico, the different drug trafficking organizations, and, and, and whether the U.S. was doing enough domestically on our drug policy, on um, weapons trafficking, difficult issues, domestic issues that play into the problems that Mexico's been experiencing. A lot of what I've written on has been on um, the Merida Initiative, which is this bilateral security cooperation effort that you don't hear about now, but um, Congress has given uh, about $2.3 billion now to Mexico um, for, to help out, um, but Mexico's invested $10, 12000000000 billion a year in security, much more than we have. And it's kind of um, been the focus of bilateral efforts around four pillars, which um, you may all know, which is disruptive in criminal organizations, institutionalizing the rule of law, building a modern border, and, and strengthening communities. I will say that since Enrique Peña Nieto and the, and the pre-return to power uh, in, in late 2012, the, the dialogue and the discourse in Washington about Mexico has totally changed. And um, those of you all who are in the United States have seen, it's not just the time the cover, it's all of the covers featuring Mexico in, in a positive light, and, and, and focusing really on, on all the reforms that have been passed and I, I had the pleasure of, um, this year of being there when the U.S. Uh, Senate met with the Mexican Senate and the, uh, the Chamber of Deputies in Mexico met with the um, U.S. House of Representatives. And it was difficult for the American legislators to be like, yeah, we haven't done that, we haven't done that, yes, we haven't done that on, on you know, weapons and trafficking, or we haven't been able to do immigration reform. But we congratulate you, Mexicans, for working across three parties, it's not just two, three, four, actually seven or eight parties, but, but you know, that you've been working in this multi-party negotiation. And so it's been a little bit of a, I think, a bit of a humble pie for our Congress to see a Congress really functioning really, really well. Um, and, and, and I know that a lot of the reforms, a lot of us um, who are analysts who are just watchers, we don't, you know, keep tabs on whether the secondary legislation has actually been passed for things like the telecommunications. Things are behind schedule already. And we don't ask the tough questions about, well, are they going to be implemented? And, and, and that's that sort of thing that we need to do that I need to keep reminding people in Congress when they're like, the pact for Mexico. Oh, and Peña Nieto, it's so wonderful. You know, we hear all the positives, but um, sometimes I have to keep, you know, reminding members of Congress that, you know, there's a lot of steps in, in getting these reforms to actually be fruitful. Um, but I will say it's been impressive, too, to look at the bilateral relationship and to see how the, ty the types of things that were talked about in the high-level economic dialogue have really become the focus in new things like energy cooperation, both in both conventional and unconventional and alternative energy, working together on those issues and working together on education have really replaced to talk about, um, you know, what types of, um, of equipment can we get. I mean, it's still happening. The Merit Initiative is still happening, but it's not the focus of, of efforts, at least at the highest levels. Um, and, and I will say that, you know, if you had asked me a couple of months ago um, to comment on security cooperation between the two countries or what the Peña Nieto government's security policy looked like, 
I would sort of have to pause and say, I'm not sure yet. It seems like it's a work in progress. It seems a little, still a little bit amorphous. You know, is it Calderon's approach just with less um, media coverage or better handling of the media? Um, why is it failing at its main goals of, of reducing kidnapping and, and extortions? Um, are they really advancing police reform? What's happening to efforts that began in that, that area under Calderon? Um, what are they going to do about the self-defense groups in Michoacan? I mean, I thought it was striking when you saw Peña Nieto and Davos, and all the questions were about Michoacan and not about investment and not about the reforms and not about what he wanted to talk about. Um, you know, the events of the last few weeks have been have been positive, and I will say that, that I'm, I'm optimistic because a lot of times what I am reading is the public realm. I'm not reading the secret tables that are coming through and that are showing all the degree of cooperation that's occurring. And what I had been seeing in the public, you know, unclassified realm was that, you know, it seemed as if extradition levels last year were down. Um, there was no high-level meeting at the cabinet level on security with Mexico last year. Um, that, you know, there was still some tension with the law enforcement that they had been, you know, put restrictions on what they were doing in Mexico. And when you look at the Merida Initiative, uh, the U.S. delivered $500 million worth of equipment and training in 2011, $265 million in 2012, but only $50 million last year. It really was, like, stuck. And you had all these people in the Mexican U.S. Embassy in Mexico waiting for Mexico to tell them what they wanted to do or whether they didn't want the money, and it's still about a billion dollars of, of, of money. And so when, you know, as of November, I was pretty worried. I was like, what's going on? Nobody's talking about this. Um, now, you have seen in the last couple of weeks that uh, Mexico uh, promulgated the new Unified Criminal Code, um, which could advance efforts. I mean, we don't know. There's not much time left to make the 2016 deadline, and I'm sure you'll comment more on that. And whether they're just, you know, you know whether they're deep enough, whether they address the real issues like police reform and, and respect for the rule of law, that still needs to be seen, I think. Um, but that could uh, promote more bilateral efforts in that area because we definitely have an interest in funding them when Mexico tells us what to do and, and what's okay. I do think it's also positive that uh, Mexico's interior and foreign ministries have, have worked together to develop a plan where they're going to uh, approve new projects for Merida at the embassy level with the U.S. embassy staff and that they in recent months, they've reached an agreement for the first $250 million of that pipeline to, to move forward. And that includes efforts with the Attorney General's office and um, I think it's 10 Mexican states. And states. So things are moving forward. I also think that all the reports you heard about um, the, the detailed cooperation that happened between Mexican Marines and a variety of U.S. law enforcement was very positive in terms of the arrest of um, Chapo Guzman. And maybe a lot of things are going on in other parts of Mexico. Probably they are in Michoacan and other areas where we are working together. So, so in, at least from my perspective, as it appears that the security cooperation is advancing, um, you know, there is a cooperation on migration, albeit there's a, 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 some of you all have mentioned there's been a big interest on Capitol Hill in balancing our concerns about security and migration at the border with trade facilitation. And I think you did see some funding in the 2014 bill. You've seen some hearings. You've seen a lot of efforts on public-private partnerships. What can we do to facilitate trade at the border and not just be worried about security concerns and, and slowing things down. Um, how can we balance our investments in the Border Patrol with our investments in the customs officers that will, will get the goods through um, the ports of entry? So I'm not an immigration specialist, um, and I, I have to, um, you know, you know, predicate my comments on immigration on that. I think this is a really tough issue. And of course, you know, my domestic analysts were, where I work uh, were very, very busy in 2013 when the Senate passed their bill. And then, you know, if I if you had asked me in late 2013, I kept asking them, is, is this the year? Is, is comprehensive reform going to happen? And back then, they were sort of optimistic. But on Friday, I was at a uh, panel um, with the Inter-American Dialogue in Washington. And Doris Meisner was making comments for the Immigration Policy Institute. And I'm just quoting her when she basically said, you know, it's going to be 2015 at the soonest that that might happen. And so all of the Latin Americans, you know, the ambassadors were there. And, and even the Central Americans were more frustrated, maybe even than the Mexicans, that all of these issues that, that were pending and, and that are that involve migration, such as removals, that's huge for, for people from Central America. The, the volume of removals, the procedures involved with removals, the lack of information sharing or, or um, um, amount of information sharing between our law enforcement and receiving countries, um, whether or not the U.S. would be willing to provide uh, assistance to people who are deported to kind of reintegrate them into their communities. We've done some pilot projects, but I don't know that there's um, funding or a will there to do that. 
Um, and then you've seen this new real concern, and there was more money in the budget, the 2014 budget, for the unaccompanied children that are coming, many, many from Central America. There may be 75,000 this year at the border, up from like six or 7,000 a few years ago. And I'm not a domestic immigration analyst, but I know that's a huge issue. And if the U.S. is struggling to deal with that, how is HHS going to help these children, you know, find a place to, to even keep them, which is not in the same detention facilities as other people? Are they going to be removed back? Can they, can they be linked? up with the family. How do we do this? I know Mexico probably struggles with some of the similar issues. And Mexico is, um, you know, they passed their own uh, migration law uh, 2011, I think. And, and some of that was to respond to criticism that they had received for being harsh and not doing enough to protect Central American immigrants from both the criminal groups, but also corrupt officials that have abused them in recent years. You see 400,000 immigrants from Central America transiting Mexico, and Mexico removing or deporting um, 70,000 to 100,000. I think in 2005, it was more than 200,000 um, people before they even got to our border. So you see Mexico caught as a, as a transit country and even a destination country. Now as it's, its levels of people leaving Mexico may be down and everyone says it's at zero, but Mexico has its own problems now trying to deal with what do we do with less resources than the United States has when we're kind of caught in the middle of this, of this, of this pattern. And so I think there's a great opportunity, I would close with saying, for U.S. and Mexican and Central American officials to all be in a dialogue, a regional dialogue on migration, and to, to address these issues, like just circularity of, of people with criminal records, or even people that don't have criminal records, coming back and forth because um, their lives are in the United States, or their families may be here, and, and, and they're not going to stay in El Salvador or Guatemala, or at least they don't appear to be doing so. What do we do about all the children that are coming alone? Um, this is a, you know, a, a humanitarian issue, I think. And, um, and I hope to do a, re a report with my colleagues at CRS um, later this year, looking at it and, and raising issues that Congress might consider. I think others are definitely doing it as well, the Migration Policy Institute and other groups are looking at this. So anyway, thank you so much, everyone, and, uh, and I look forward to your questions. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. I want to thank the organizers for the kind invitation. 20 years ago, Mexico signed the North American Free Trade Agreement with the U.S. and Canada. This represented a turning point for the country, not only in economic and trade issues, but also in terms of its society, its culture, and its institutions. Seminars were held in many U.S. universities, UCSD included, to analyze the profound transformations that were taking place south of the border. Many asked then if Mexico was finally on its way to become a fully developed country. And, and what are the basic elements that mark the line that a nation must cross to be considered to develop? At the risk of so oversimplifying, we can say that a developed country meets three basic conditions. A stable free market economy, an open political system where democracy is the only game in town, and a strong rule of law enforced by a reliable justice system. In two of these three areas, Mexico has been clearly moving forward. Our integration into the North American economy put in motion a wave of deep economic transformation. Trade barrier were systematically lower, transforming Mexico from an inward-looking oil-dependent economy to an open export-based industrial powerhouse. Today, Mexico exports more manufacturers than all the nations of Latin America combined. Macroeconomic discipline became a solid foundation of the nation's growth after decades of public overspending and inflation and stability. Key economic institutions, such as the central bank, were reinforced and became the cornerstone for financial responsibility. Mexico also moved forward in the democratic front. We went from a semi-authoritarian one-party regime to a vibrant, competitive, multi-party system. Political elites built a strong electoral system, which guaranteed 
free election of students. Society fought, fought and won for political and civil liberties. However, however Mexico has not experienced the same deep transformation in the rule of law and justice system. The third foundation of Mexico development has remained weak, weak almost untouched. This in part explains the deep insecurity crisis that the country has experienced since the late 1990s. The old regime justice system was designed with a single purpose, ensuring political control. The system was, was more or less effective to contain crime, but it never created the necessary institutions to build a true democratic rule of law. As our moderator, David Schirch, has put it, put it, police and justice reform has not kept pace with Mexico's democratic regime change, and I agree completely. We have experienced a profound political transition, but our security and justice institutions remain stuck in the past. This factor explains in a large extent our security crisis. It's one of the elements that may pose you what has been called the perfect storm. How does this perfect storm look like? As you will see in the next graph, murder, kidnappings, and robbery rates have grown steadily in the last 20 years. Murder has become a true epidemic, reaching outstanding peaks since the, since the 2000s. Despite a recent, recent downward trend, murder rates remain too high for a nation with the development levels of Mexico. Kidnapping doubled in the last decades and remains as one of the most feared crimes in many areas of the country. An extortion has become a sad reminder that in many parts of Mexico, crime is extracting rents from society with absolute impunity. How, how do we get to this point? We really don't have a full developed answer. But let me show some indicators that I think lie in the origin of the problem. The first is impunity. A stark example is impunity for murder, which is estimated at 80%. This means that if you kill someone in Mexico, there are 8 out of 10 chances that you will get away with it. For robbery, the impunity rate reaches 90%. So, as you can see, crime goes up in Mexico, as the chances of getting caught are very low. The second indicator is the absence of crime by reports to authorities. 90% of all crimes go unreported in Mexico. This is both a cause and an effect of lawlessness. The third indicator is the low confidence that the public has in security and justice institutions. While the Army and the Navy enjoy wide public support, the judges and the general attorney office and the police forces run much lower in public esteem. An example, an expression of how this lack of trust is eroding Mexican society is the existence of more than 100 vigilante organizations across the nation called self-defense groups. Some of them have had armed clashes with both the criminal organizations and the authorities. And the fourth indication, indicator sorry, sorry. is the weakness of security and justice institutions. As you can see in the graph, the number of intentional homicides per year rose sharply, but the annual number of solved cases remained unchanged. According to the World Justice Project, Mexico's criminal justice system is the most of the worst globally. Mexico's criminal justice system stands in the 91st place out of 97 countries in the World Justice Project ranking. 
Mexico's score is equal to that of Liberia and only some points above that of Venezuela, the lowest ranking country. In sum, Mexico today has an economy the size of Italy or South Korea. It has political institutions that have ensured an orderly transition to democracy, but it has the justice system of Liberia, a nation that ranks in the bottom level of the United Nations Human Development Indicators. Where does all these levels? My main concern is that while in Mexico and abroad there is a lot of talk about economic and political reforms, less attention is being paid to the area that need, needs more effort. Everybody is talking about telecommunication, education, competition, and of course energy reform. But from the 2008 criminal justice reform is still facing daunting challenges. Only three of out of 32 states show major advance in implementation of this key reform. The main actors of the justice system, prosecutors, judges, and attorneys, lack of new capabilities for this system. Police investigation processes should be modernized and improved. The reform demands better infrastructure for criminal justice, justice institutions. Can Mexico become a developed nation in this context? The answer is clearly no. Mexico needs a renewed commitment from most political actors for an effective and profound justice reform. Strengthen both federal and especially local security and justice institutions. Build new capacities among police and criminal justice operators. Build confidence in the benefits of having a society who believes in the rule of law. In conclusion, Mexico is moving forward. In those areas where it was already moving forward, economic reforms are welcome to improve growth rates and ensure a better quality of life for millions of impoverished Mexicans. Political reforms are, are of course needed to enhance the political representation and accountability system. But the area that has been long neglected, the rule of law, is still lagging behind in terms of public and academic, academic debate, the government's agenda and budget, and institutional strengthening, especially at the local level. My concern is that 20 years from now, we will still be wondering if Mexico is moving forward or not. The answer will depend on whether or not Mexico is capable of building a new security and justice system. It is up to us in the academia and civil society to address the issue and raise it in Mexico's list of priorities. Only by keeping this debate alive and kicking, we will be able to push key decision makers to take the necessary steps to build a strong rule of law. The challenges are enormous, but Mexico has no option if it wants to join the ranks of developed nations. Thank you very much. So we have uh, some time for questions and discussion. Um, I think that the organizers are going to somehow tweet to me uh, your tweets, uh, or feel free to tweet uh, to me or any of the panelists. I'm sure twit. Uh, that's for short for Twitter. Um, uh, here it is. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I think you know we look at uh, the. There has been so much progress in the last 20 years in Mexico. The Mexico that we look at today is not the Mexico of 20 years ago. It is not the country of, of, of vacillating uh, G GDP rates, uh, of, of uh, peso devaluations. Mexico weathered 
the, uh, the, the 2008 uh, global economic downturn like a champ. And, and we have seen tremendous progress, yet we have also seen uh, that there are uh, huge gaps, uh, huge uh, areas for growth, huge challenges. Um, what, first of all, let's start on a bright note. Why was Enrique Peña Nieto so successful in his first year at achieving such a broad array, array of reforms? Uh, this is a person who many people, uh, during the lead up to the 2012 Mexican presidential elections, <coughs> thought was a lightweight because he had only read two and a half books. Um, what What is his secret? Why has he been so successful? Uh, anyone? Uh, Juan, uh, do you want to think about it? Well, uh, first, first uh, we have to look where we came from, which was 15 years of, of gridlock. So uh, there was kind of a boiling point that the whole political class need to bring results. Then uh, President Peña Nieto had a huge advantage that he didn't have the PRI as an opposition, uh, which could come very handy if you're the president of Mexico, as it was shown for 12 years during the Panista administration. Uh, it has shown so far a painful equilibrium that the Panistas are much, much better in the opposition than gov in, gov uh, than in government, and the Priistas are much, much better in government than in uh, the opposition. Uh, and to, to keep it short, uh, I think one of the big mistakes of uh, the adversaries of, of uh, Mr. Peña Nieto during the campaign it was to underestimate him. Uh, he, I think he's a good listener. Uh, he has the capability of deciding, and he has proven to be a, a, a very good uh, decision maker and power broker. Uh, so this combination of, of factors has led Mexico to, to finish this, process, this time period of gridlock. But I would not say it's just his uh, merit or success. It's also the success of the whole political uh, system in Mexico and, uh, and uh, the democracy itself. Can I? Uh, can yeah, please. Uh, uh, others. I just uh, the cover of Time, you know, has Peña Nieto on the front, and there's been a cover that's been ridiculed by many people. There are fabulous mock-ups of him as the Virgen de Guadalupe, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But inside, it, and, and you do have to read the article because I think the people jump to too many conclusions about it, but inside there's a photograph of Peña Nieto and behind him there's Luis Figueroa on one side and Miguel Ángel Osorio Chong on the other. It's a great picture because, you know, as people have always told me, uh, you know, he, he, Peña Nieto is a man who knows what he doesn't know. And so he has terrific advisors. And I'm not saying he's Ronald Reagan, but there are certain similarities that you can draw there. He's not a genius, but he has a great team behind him, and he listens to them, and he knows how to pick out what may be a winning formula from that. But I think that that photograph is actually wrong. I think you could substitute actually Miguel Angel Osorio Chong and Luis Villagaray with the leader of the PAN, Gustavo Madero, and the leader of the PRD, Jesus Zambrano. You have uh, uh, an incredible opportunity beginning in December of, uh, of 2012, where both opposition parties are severely divided internally, and both of their leaderships are looking to be rele uh, relevant. And that offers an opportunity, a political opening, because, and people in this room may disagree with me, but I think that ultimately Mexican political DNA is priesta. I think that's how they think. I think that ultimately at the, at the core level, it's a question of do you want to be in the room or do you want to be outside of the room? Do you want to be in the photograph or do you not want to appear in the photograph? And the relevance of this is that if you have a seat at the table, you may have some kind of impact over the decision that's taken. Both Gustavo Madero and Jesus Zambrano took the decision that in the context of divided parties, if they wanted to maintain their relevance and their importance, they had to work with the government. And so all the things that Juan has said is absolutely right, but this couldn't have happened if you had had entirely united opposition that didn't feel the need to collaborate with the government. Alternatively, you could say that in, let's say, a European system, having a divided opposition may actually be a disadvantage because you don't have reliable partners. But I think in the Mexican context, it worked out incredibly well. A mí me gustaría poner en discusión la otra perspectiva. 
la perspectiva del presidente este no ha sido necesariamente exitoso en, en, en general, eh, pues ocurre esto para los mexicanos. Por eso tenemos un, un, un divorcio entre la perspectiva eh, en el extranjero sobre el, el gobierno del presidente y la perspectiva de los mexicanos, que en, en encuestas de confianza del consumidor, en encuestas sobre aprobación presidencial, muestran una enorme desconfianza. No se han comparado la idea de la mexicana en momento. Los mexicanos no la, no, no la han asumido. Eh, y, y creo que eh, la economía mexicana el año pasado creció apenas 1%. Eh, se, se estuvo ajustando a lo largo del año la, las proyecciones, las estimaciones de crecimiento. Y este primer trimestre también eh, eh, pinta mal. O sea, no, no parece que el presidente tener las mismas capacidades para plantear una agenda de reformas y procesarla legislativamente y para gobernar y generar eh, resultados concretos. Y me parece que este dilema está presente a lo largo de, 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 de no solo el arranque, sino su primer, este primer, los primeros tres años. Y, y ahí es donde vamos a, a poder dar el calificativo de exitoso o no. Si la economía no logra remontar, si la aprobación del presidente, si la confianza de los mexicanos en el gobierno no mejora, entonces pues, el, el, el éxito será muy relativo. So, uh, uh, to reiterate this point, I mean, for many Mexicans, these, uh, uh, these accomplishments have not materialized. Um, uh, first of all, it's only been a year, but uh, it's, it's been a year in which we had 1% GDP growth in Mexico, not spectacular. Uh, and there are many Mexicans who don't feel that, uh, that uh, the efforts that are being made in, 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 uh, in national politics are playing out in ways that affect them positively uh, in their individual lives. Um, with that in mind, I mean, what, and this is uh, from a question from Jeremy, Jeremy Martin, um, who tweeted it directly to Shirtwit. Um, what, what about, about uh, the, what, what are some of the things that could unlock Mexico's potential for growth and, and to transform uh, economic stagnation into uh, a, a, a more competitive and, and um, uh, highly productive uh, uh, situation, and particularly uh, for, for uh, Juan Pardinas and for, for Aztec Duncan, um, much better than Church um, um, What about energy? What, what about the electrical sector and, and what that means for competitiveness? I mean, everybody's focused on oil. What about electricity? Um, and also, of course, uh, uh, shale. Uh, what are some of the other kinds of things that uh, are going to lead to greater competitiveness? Maybe Juan can start with that and then Duncan. Uh, 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 if, if you look at the Mexican energy sector, the reform was deep and transformational. But if you look at the rest of the world, we are basically doing what other countries did 30, 20, or 10 years ago. Uh, so in that regard, we're just putting in time uh, the, the energy sector and, the, and, and kind of dismantling some crimes against logic or absurdities that were ruling the, uh, the economic model regarding energy. One of them was mentioned by, by Carlos Elizondo this morning. We have the six largest reserves in the world of, of shale, and we also have huge uh, resources of, of natural gas. But as it's forbidden for private investors to be, bring gas from the ground, and Pemex had the mind to increase public revenue the most, and gas has uh, uh, smaller prices than oil, no one invested in gas. It was forbidden to have private investment in gas, and it was uh, uh, irrational from the perspective of Pemex to invest in gas. But then, good luck, we are neighbors with the most efficient gas producer in the world, but we didn't have enough infrastructure to bring the gas from Texas south of the border. So as Carlos mentioned, it, we had to bring gas, this happened last year, from Nigeria, around $20 uh, per million BTUs, when the price in Texas was at $3 uh, per million of BTUs. This is how rational the energy uh, uh, sector in Mexico works. Most 
most of these gas worked to, uh, was used to power uh, electricity plants. So places like Jalisco had to suffer uh, basically bre breakouts in, in the energy flow, which affected growth uh, in a very relevant way, especially in 2012 and 2013. So it's not what we could, uh, where the, the energy sector was not just about the energy sector, it was about the rest of the economy and how we were losing competitiveness, the possibility to integrate ourselves uh, in different chains of production with uh, North, uh, North America. Uh, an industrial once told me, I really not, don't know if I'm going to build a second plant. We are very successful with our first plant. We are exporting out of parts uh, to the U.S. But I'm afraid of not having enough energy. I could pay gas at four times the price that, is the other, uh, that, that it's paid in the U.S. What I cannot afford is not having gas, not having energy because my clients will start looking from other places in the world where to buy the auto parts. They need to have just-in-time inventories. So in that sense, the energy reform kind of allowed the rest of the economy just to keep up with the challenge, challenges we have. And the second part of the reform is how we're going to make it really transform the whole economy and not just make it barely survive as it, as it used to be. Um, yeah, to, to add on to that, the, the difference in the price of, uh, of electricity paid by Mexican uh, industry uh, versus their U.S. counterparts is about 18%. That's a very, very big difference when you're looking at competitiveness. So much so that, uh, you know, as in the case that, uh, that one just uh, mentioned, uh, a number of firms have actually looked at investing in the United States as opposed to investing in Mexico for their future plants. And we actually saw uh, one company in particular close down a plant in Mexico and move to the United States, and the reason they did that was because of the cost of, of, of energy in Mexico. Now, the government is selling the energy reform uh, in, uh, to part of the, uh, the public by saying that it will result in lower energy prices um, for industry and for the public. I'm not sure that's actually going to be true for the public because, of course, we're going to see an elimination of the subsidies on gasoline, um, which will result in rising prices. But in terms of um, the cost of electricity for, uh, for industry, there is the very real possibility that prices will come down. Is it as a result of the reform, though? Well, some people will say yes, because you're going to see more generation being built, generation capacity being built in Mexico, and all of those new plants are going to be gas-powered. But the fact is, is that if you had invested 10 years ago, not just in, not in an energy reform, but simply in building pipelines across the border from the United States to bring in sufficient natural gas, you could have had a very similar uh, effect. Now, the government will say that this is as a result of the energy reform, and I think that the increased demand from uh, private generator generators for natural gas will be a factor that will push forward the construction of cross-border pipelines into Mexico, bringing in cheaper U.S. gas. I think that's a very positive uh, phenomenon, but it's also going to take a, a, a certain amount of time. We have the Los Ramones pipeline being constructed right now, and that will satisfy national demand for natural gas up to 2018. But in order to satisfy national demand for natural gas beyond 2018, we should be building the next pipeline now. And that's what we're not doing in Mexico. That's a very, very real problem that I see there. In terms of the shale sector, uh, to answer the second part of Jeremy's question, I think the shale sector offers an enormous opportunity for certain niche firms. And there are certain firms that are already present in Mexico who are, who are there as services companies, but in fact, they're operators in the US as well. And one of those, a Texas-based firm, which I won't name, has been operating in Mexico for, uh, for about 10 years. And their experience has been very, very informative. They've been providing services to Pemex in Coahuila, drilling exploratory wells in, in the shale fields. And they are perfectly placed right now to capitalize on the, uh, on the oil reform and to become an operator and to, uh, to exploit oil and gas in the shale fields. And the story that they tell us is that, you know, it's going to be a very big opportunity, but it's also going to be enormously costly to do it because you have to understand the local circumstances. You have to understand the lack of infrastructure. You have to overcome the problem with water. You have to overcome the problem with local security. Not just big organized crime, but disorganized crime at the local level. The guys who show up at your site and say, uh, we're kind of affiliated with the Zetas. Well, we used to be with the Zetas, but now we're with somebody else. 
you know, how do you feel about paying us a little bit out of your nomina, out of your payroll? And you say, well, do we take this seriously? Do we not? Do this? All of this takes time and it slows things down. As their representative said to me, he said, it's a daily bother. It's not that it stops you from investing, but it's a daily bother. And then there's the big one, which I think is infrastructure. When you look at what's happened in southern Texas, one of the best things that you can do to understand the scale of, of the shale revolution in southern Texas is to fly over it at night, because it looks like a city at night, just with the whole of southern Texas with all these flares, the gas flaring from the, from the fields. If you want to see what, why that's been successful, it's because as soon as contracts are signed, the municipality comes in and builds roads so that the firms can get there to the shale site. That's not going to happen in Mexico. Or if it does happen, it's going to take a lot longer for it to happen because you don't have responsive local authorities. You don't have responsive state authorities. So all of these things are going to slow down the process. In 10 years' time, I'm pretty sure that it'll be a big success. But in the short term, I think we, we should expect a modest movement on shale. Great. We're down to our last few moments. Um, there are a couple of, of questions, I think, that we haven't been able to address um, and, and may not be able to address before the end of the panel. But, uh, for example, education reform was a huge effort over the last year. Um, was it enough? Is it going to uh, achieve um, what uh, Mexico needs to produce the number of engineers uh, that, that uh, we need for the oil sector or for uh, other areas? Um, also, you know, something that hasn't been clearly defined is in Mexico's, um, is, is some people mentioned in the panel this morning, um, the effect of the border and uh, slow border wait times on the overall, you know, $500 uh, uh, billion dollar NAFTA economy. Um, we hear a lot of talk about smart borders and we hear a lot of talk about uh, trying to facilitate trade, uh, but we see a huge drag on the border because of the um, uh, border wait times. Um, and, and lastly, uh, there's a question here about um, the, uh, the, the the rule of law situation. And I, uh, I think uh, what I didn't hear from Edna were the solutions. Um, we passed a reform for uh, for improving the criminal justice system in 2008, and then we went through five years of, of deadly violence, uh, and um, are still uh, not seeing the changes that we we need to address. Uh, I mean, there are, there are still so many challenges uh, for Mexico looking forward. Uh, maybe what I'll just ask each of you to do in the last uh, few seconds is give me your 15 seconds on uh, what the solutions uh, to these problems are. Maybe we'll give. 30 seconds each. Um, but, but uh, you know, where, where, with so many lingering challenges, um, are you optimistic or pessimistic about where Mexico is headed on some of these, uh, these very complex issues? Uh, and I'll go in reverse order, maybe starting with Edna. Well, the thema de seguridad y la justicia tenemos un reto enorme, enorme. Eh, eh, creo que en los últimos años hemos avanzado en, en la construcción de ciertas capacidades, sobre todo a nivel federal. Eh, por lo que creo que pues, podemos ser optimistas. Eh, lo que me preocupa es que no esté en la agenda, que no esté en la agenda como una prioridad la construcción de capacidades locales en términos de policías, de ministerios públicos, el sistema penitenciario en México es, es una desgracia, no está en la agenda. Pero creo que en el momento que, que si logramos ponerlo en la lista de prioridades, si logramos, eh, eh, pues, eh, convocar a los actores políticos, a, ahora sí un pacto a favor de la legalidad y el Estado de Derecho, quizá podamos avanzar. ¿no? Si esta ola de reforma resulta exitosa, ¿por qué no podríamos tener también éxito reformándonos la justicia? Um, I think in the same vein in the rule of law and security, um, it's, not, it's not something that's being talked about at the high level, and I don't know whether keeping it at a lower level behind the scenes is, is enough, but I think that the, uh, the money is there and, and the experience um, at, at the state level, some have been more successful than others, and I think um, the challenge now will be to harmonize what it was just um, um, you know, passed at the federal level with all these state codes and things, and, and you have a willingness on the part of the U.S. government to help out, 
in, in, in that area, but, but without a partner that's telling you what they want to do, you have, um, you wait a whole year basically to go back to what you were doing to begin with under the Calderon government. You know, we're different, we don't want that, we're so, you know, we've maybe some drug courts, you know, we want to do some different stuff, prevention stuff different, but in the, in the end, this is what we want, this is what we agreed to, it looks a whole lot like what you were already doing a year and a half, two years ago, so you have, you have some wasted time, and now you have to have a sense of urgency in order to, to really um, tell the U.S. and tell other donors how you want things to go, what kinds of aid you need, and the U.S. has to be ready to kind of organize it well, and, 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 and to, like you were saying, that your experiences as somebody trying to implement these programs hasn't been the best, and, and I don't know, um, you know, how, how we're ready to be helpful enough to enough states to get this through without watering down what we're doing and, and, and doing enough training in particular areas. Um, very quickly, uh, is the cup half full or is it half empty? I think that's the wrong question. Is the cup more full than it was last year, the year before that? And I think it is. I think the cup is filling. Um, and I, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic um, for, for a number of reasons. But I'll give one very local reason, which is I crossed the border this morning going south. And the new facility, the border crossing at Chaparral, is impressive. The Mexican government did their job. They delivered on time. They put in place a fantastic facility. If the U.S. could do the same thing, we could actually achieve enormous <laughs> savings at the border. Well, I, I have the professional obligation to be an optimist. Uh, as, uh, as uh, trying to, to sell ideas of public policy in Mexico, I, I'm convinced that the country can change if our institutions can change. And I think the biggest challenge that cuts horizontally all the subjects we have talked about is uh, federalism. We have a very dysfunctional, uh, dysfunctional federalism from, from public security, from a municipal president investing in the right roads to uh, bring jail and uh, Gas. Uh, when when an American thinks of federalism, he thinks of Jay Madison and Hamilton. <laughs> when a Mexican thinks of federalism, we think of Moreira, Andres Gagnier, and Juan Sabines, which are some of the not most well-renowned Mexican politicians currently. So if we fix, uh, uh, manage to fix federalism, a lot of things will happen in Mexico. Well, I think we have to leave it there. It's easy to be frustrated uh, and pessimistic in the face of challenges. Um, and especially when these are challenges that we would urgently wish to resolve, uh, problems of poverty, problems of insecurity, etc. Uh, what I always uh, like to counsel is that um, an, an, an idealist is never happy. An idealist is always uh, pessimistic about whether, where things are now because they want things to be so much better. But a realist, a realist, a realist has more measured expectations and a longer time horizon, and therefore can always be optimistic. Uh, so uh, let's let's uh, uh, hope that uh, in, in the intermediate term and the long term, uh, Mexico will continue moving forward. Thank you very much. Thank you to our wonderful panelists and David Shirk for a great moderating um, of this discussion. We want to give you a quick break, but we ask that you please be back here in the auditorium. We need to get started exactly at 345. Thank you. Mm -hmm.